Good afternoon, everyone. I am Council Member Carlina Rivera, Chair of the Committee on Hospitals, and I'd like to start off by thanking my colleagues and fellow members of the committee for joining us today. Today we'll hear from representatives of health and hospitals and other stakeholders about the ongoing transformations occurring in the way care is delivered in our healthcare system. These changes impact every one of us. Access to adequate health care is a fundamental human right, and we must ensure that every New Yorker has access to quality, affordable care. Hospitals are in the process of transforming the way they provide care to communities by expanding the availability of outpatient and community-based services while concurrently reducing inpatient capacity. Additionally, the Delivery System Reform Incentive Payment, or DISRIP, program has fundamentally changed the way many receive their care. DISRIP focuses on reducing avoidable hospitalizations and providing more value-based and patient-centered care by allowing hospitals, providers, and community-based organizations to work together to provide individuals with Medicaid and those who are uninsured with higher quality and more effective care. The basis for healthcare transformation, including DISRIP, centers around a triple aim, providing better care for individuals, bettering the overall health of the population, and lowering costs by improving health care. As the chair of the hospitals committee and a member of the community that has been experiencing significant changes in the way health care services are provided, I want to ensure that health system transformations are positively and meaningfully changing the lives of those who need care. While there are individuals who are receiving more coordinated care as a result of these changes, there are many of us who remain concerned. Many of us here today are also familiar with the transformation of Mount Sinai Beth Israel. In May 2016, the Mount Sinai system announced plans to close the 800-bed Mount Sinai Beth Israel Medical Center and replace it with the new 70-bed Mount Sinai Downtown Beth Israel Hospital and Emergency Room with a network of outpatient centers and doctor's offices. As someone who has been vocal throughout this process, the closure of departments over the past couple years has led to increased anxiety within the community about the availability of services. This hospital is very important to my district and to, and to the city. And we saw the impact that the closure of St. Vincent's had on not just Beth Israel, but our public, our public hospital down the street, Bellevue. As a former member of the Bellevue Community Advisory Board, our focus on that board was always patient care and advocacy first. And that was constantly challenged as this facility continued to face financial strain in the larger system and an expectation from voluntary hospitals that those uninsured, underinsured, and not near another voluntary hospital could go to H&H &H instead. But this downsizing and transformation at Mount Sinai Beth Israel is not alone in this wave of change. According to the State Department of Health, 78 hospital mergers or acquisitions were approved or pending between 2011 and September 2017, and 764 hospital beds were lost between 2015 and 2017 throughout the state. Although this transformation process is regulated by the state, we, the representatives of those who will face the effects of such changes, must and will take the time to examine this process and its impact on vulnerable populations in our community as a whole. Today we want to examine these transformations, understand the context in which they are occurring, discuss their impacts, and explore the level of community engagement involved in these processes. To best meet the needs of the community, the community itself, patients, providers, and advocates, must be at the decision-making table. As healthcare continues to change, we must ensure that individuals and communities retain access to care that meets their needs. Our healthcare system is very complicated and has many moving parts. Today's hearing is a great opportunity to hear about many of the ways in which our healthcare providers are improving the care of those they serve, as well as potential areas for improvement. I'd like to thank those who are here to testify today, including representatives from hospitals, as well as community members and advocates. It is crucial to have all stakeholders at the table for this discussion, including physicians, advocates, patients, and hospital representatives. I look forward to our robust discussion. So first, 
Okay, great. No, you're good. All right, I'll do it. So I want to thank uh, the administration for being here. And before we begin, just uh, to swear you in, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me. Good afternoon, uh, Chairperson Rivera and members of the committee. My name is Matt Siegler. I'm a Senior Vice President at Health and Hospitals. I lead managed care, patient growth, uh, and I'm our interim leader for government and community relations. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to testify here today. And uh, on behalf of Dr. Katz, I want to apologize that he's not able to be here. Every Wednesday afternoon, he sees patients as a primary care doctor at our Gouverneur Health Center, which is just a mile or so up the road from here. Uh, next to the East Broadway stop. So if you don't have a primary care doctor or you've never been to Gouverneur and just want to check it out, it's a beautiful facility and I hope you uh, go have a look at it. But he's uh, very committed to his patients and uh, so we're, we're pleased that he's there but he's uh, uh, unfortunately could not be here today. Uh, I'm joined by Bridget Ingram from our uh, government community relations team. Hopefully you and your staffs uh, know Bridget and work with her closely. And I'm also joined uh, by our Vice President for Primary Care, uh, Dr. Ted Long, who uh, Dr. Katz described to me today as a more enthusiastic and energetic version of Dr. Katz, if you think that's possible. So I uh, hope you get a chance to meet Ted and he can tour you around some of our ambulatory care sites around the city. Um, this hearing uh, addresses a timely and important topic for health and hospitals and for the broader healthcare industry. Uh, as, as the chair mentioned, through advances in medical practice and technology, as well as a better understanding of how to deliver care efficiently and effectively, more care is moving from the inpatient setting to the outpatient or even virtual settings, telemedicine and new technologies like that. The shift is a welcome change for both patients and clinicians. The more safe and convenient we can make it for patients to get their care, the sooner we can get them home if they do need to come to the hospital, uh, the better it is for patients and for the health system overall. Uh, and, and Health and Hospitals is, is all in on this change. We're committed to making this change and, it's, uh, uh, and to serving our patients in this way. In 2016, the, the city correctly identified uh, this trend and, and capitalizing on it as key to health and hospitals future. The One New York Healthcare for Our Neighborhood report presented a comprehensive plan to transform health and hospitals into a high performing, competitive and sustainable community based system. As noted in the report and uh, in subsequent data released by our system, uh, inpatient hospital stays have declined in recent years. Uh, they've declined at health and hospitals as well as in the broader industry. And while we've seen some of these downward trends uh, at health and hospitals level out in recent years as we've begun to uh, in invest in new clinical capability, uh, the shift away from inpatient care to outpatient care is continuing and, and will continue. So we need to transform our public health system to better serve our patients and communities by enhancing access to ambulatory care services, by addressing social determinants of health, and by restructuring our clinical services to provide 21st century health care for all New Yorkers. One challenge with this transition to outpatient care is making sure the financial incentives are aligned. Um, historically, the financial model in American healthcare was for doctors and hospitals to bill on a fee-for-service basis. That essentially means that the more care delivered and the more expensive the care delivered, the better a provider could do financially. Thankfully, we're taking steps in New York State and around the country towards paying for the value of the care delivered, not just the quantity of that care. As the chair mentioned, the state's delivery system reform incentive payment program, or DISRIP, uh, is one reflection of this shift. The goal to reduce avoidable hospitalizations by 25% and restructure the healthcare delivery system are critically important, and Health and Hospitals is uh, very focused on it. The move away from unnecessary emergency department visits from unnecessary readmissions, from unnecessary hospitalizations, have a critical financial impact on health and hospitals and all hospitals involved in the program uh, and are very important. <laughs> so that shift does require uh, significant changes in staffing and the culture of healthcare delivery systems. While you know, some hospitals continue to compete for patients based on uh, expensive tests and consultations with specialists and patient stays, uh, that's not health and hospitals focus. We are committed to value-based payment and delivering efficient, high-value care. And I think we're well positioned to capitalize on this shift for, for a number of reasons. Our physicians are largely salaried, meaning they uh, have no incentive to deliver expensive and unnecessary care just for the financial impact. 
and much of our business comes through risk-based contracts, meaning we share in the savings if we deliver efficient and high-quality care. One additional way I think we're well positioned to capitalize on this is our connection to the community. I spent last night with uh, our Council of Community Advisory Boards. I know uh, the chair was a member of the Bellevue Cab, and that connection to the community and investment in our hospitals I think is critical to making sure we capitalize on this shift to outpatient care and, and can deliver a good care that's valuable to the community. Um, so, d you know, despite these structural advantages, capitalizing on this shift does require significant changes. And uh, Dr. Katz has shared with the committee in the past, his goal is to accelerate the transformation of our system in order to ensure its long-term stability by focusing on three critical priorities. Investing in and expanding primary care, improving access to much needed specialty care, and achieving fiscal solvency for the system. And these goals are connected, obviously. In recent months, thanks to the generous support of the mayor, the council, and other elected officials, we've opened a new community health center on Staten Island. We've renovated and reopened another community health center in lower Manhattan. And we've continued our efforts to use technology to expand access to needed specialty care. In July, we opened Health and Hospital's first full service ambulatory care center on Staten Island. NYC Health and Hospital's Gotham Health Vanderbilt, it's its name. It's gonna expand access to primary care for clinicians and adults, mental health counseling and referrals, opioid treatment and other services. In August, I was uh, thrilled to see the, the chair at a celebration of the modernization and reopening of uh, our Gotham Roberto Clemente Center, uh, which has provided care to Manhattan's Lower East Side for 30 years. The health center provides expanded access to essential primary care and behavioral health services. In that same time, we've continued to expand our use of our e-consult system, which allows primary care doctors to get specialists' opinions on their patients virtually. Now, instead of waiting weeks or longer for a specialist's appointment, a primary care doctor can get a specialist consultation within hours or a couple of days. We've more than doubled the number of e-consults occurring across our system in the past year, and we're thrilled to use this technology to continue ex to expand specialty access outside the four walls of the hospital. Going forward, we're launching a series of strategic initiatives designed to transform our health system's vast ambulatory care operation, improve access to in-demand primary and specialty care, and reverse the recent trend of declining outpatient visits. We've just announced, as of this morning, a five-point strategy that will become adopted across our public health systems, more than 70 community-based health centers and hospitals. And together, they provide more than five million outpatient visits to children and adults every year. The plan is focused on five key priorities. One is to fix the continuity of care, to build fidelity with a assigned primary care physician. So that's all about making sure you're seeing your primary care doctor every time you come in for a visit. If you see a new primary care doctor every time, it's difficult to build that relationship that really improves care and make sure uh, you have that familiarity and connection. The second goal of the five-point plan is to reduce no-show rates. Uh, a large percentage of the appointments that are made in our system, uh, patients are either, the appointments are so far out or they don't work for the person's schedule uh, that there's a no-show rate and that creates problems in how our clinics flow and how they function. So we wanna reduce that uh, with technology like sending people text messages and reminding them of their appointments and scheduling visits same day or next day by leaving some open slots in the scheduling system. Next, we wanna expand our use of e-consult, as we've talked about in the past. So having, making sure you can get a good specialty consult and opinion through a visit to your primary care doctor is a critical way to improve our ambulatory care system, and we're hyper-focused on that. Next, we wanna make sure that all of our clinicians in the outpatient setting are practicing at the top of their license. So making sure nurses are doing what everything nurses are capable of doing, doctors are doing what doctors are doing, and all the support staff uh, handle the necessary work for them. We don't want uh, you know, doctors are not, doctors do everything in our system, they're, they're not above any kind of work, but having a doctor, uh, you know, answer the phone or do things like that is not the best use of that clinician's time. We need them seeing patients as much as possible and really working to uh, improve health. And then finally, it, you, we, we have to have uh, improving billing and coding and insurance verification as a part of any strategy in our ambulatory care setting. Uh, making sure that health and hospitals gets paid fairly by insurance companies uh, is a critical part of our our transformation plan. So that's part of our ambulatory care plan as well. So from these steps to improve ambulatory care to our new partnerships with city agencies and community groups to address social determinants of health, we're committed to delivering high quality care where and when our patients need it. 
We know that there will always be a need for inpatient hospitals, and the critical role that our facilities play in their communities cannot be overstated. But moving towards a community-based care model will deliver better care, lower costs, and we're committed to partnering with our staff, our providers, and this committee to changing in this changing marketplace. So again, I appreciate the opportunity to testify here today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you so much. I, I wanted to quickly um, thank every, every people in the healthcare system, specifically at Bellevue. Uh, we had a fire in my district this morning, and there were a number of people injured, and so I wanted to thank you and ev all of the first responders who were there on scene through the night and that will remain there, so, so thank you for, for that. Um, so I wanted to ask, oh yeah, I wanted to recognize my council members who are here who have joined me, including uh, Council Member Maisel, Council Member Reynoso, Council Member Levine, uh, Council Member Ayala, and Council Member Moya. So before I uh, turn to my colleagues, I know a couple of them have questions. I wanted to ask uh, a few things, of course. Um, Clearly we are here because of the transformation and because we, we do have a lot of questions, not just of H&H, &H, um, but of the voluntary hospital system and your relationship, which I really do think is dependent on the other. I think we do need both to uh, serve every single New Yorker that walks into its doors to ensure that we have a healthy city. And I know that that's not always the case, and so we're here to um, talk a, a little bit about some of the, the hospitals that have closed and who are downsizing and how that's going to actually affect how you provide services. So I had a couple of general questions. So why is outpatient community-based health care oftentimes more effective than inpatient care? Well, I think it's a great question. And, and uh, you know, inpatient care is certainly more effective for certain things, right? I, I think trauma surgery, I I invasive procedures that require long hospital stays, you, you can't do that on an outpatient basis. But I think a, a simple answer, and I'm not a clinician, so my Dr. Katz can correct me after the fact, but you know, the, the simple reason is that um, people can do better recovering at home. Getting home from hospitals is, uh, is better for people's recovery. And then I think on the primary care basis, the basis from my perspective of any good healthcare system is making sure people are getting in and getting preventive care, staying ahead of health issues before they arise. And you can't really stay ahead of healthcare issues if you're focused on an inpatient hospital stay, right? You need people to get into primary care, see a doctor on an ongoing basis, take their medications, and that can and all should be done on an outpatient basis. So, uh, you know, meeting patients where they are, making sure you're getting ahead of health issues before they arise, I'd say that's probably the foundation of why it's important to have a strong outpatient system. How has H&H &H shifted its resources to kind of accommodate this transition? That, uh, we're, we're hyper-focused on it and, and uh, across the care continuum. We're hiring primary care doctors at a, at a rapid pace as quickly as we can, um, you know, continuing to invest in our inpatient facilities because we, they are such critical parts of the community and de deliver very necessary services. Uh, but our focus on hiring primary care doctors, on building outpatient facilities, not just in Staten Island as we did in July, but around the city, uh, that's a real shift in resources and a focus for us. So investing in new sites, investing in new doctors, and putting the technology in place to make sure that we connect our outpatient centers to the broader healthcare system. So you brought up two, two things that I think are important. One is you, you brought up primary care physicians, which, which I agree that it's important to have a primary care physician who gets to know their patient over time and who's there to answer questions instead of someone coming in with a common cold into the emergency room. Uh, and there are a lot of factors that influence why someone would come into the emergency room for a common cold. Um, but there is a shortage of doctors as well in terms of primary care physicians. So how are you going about, um, re I guess, responding or reacting to that issue? And I know it puts a tremendous amount of pressure on, on the nurses that are in the hospital. So how is H&H &H responding to, to that shortage and, and kind of what are you doing to make sure that all of the people inside your hospitals have the mental and physical capacity to serve patients at 100%? Okay, well, it's a, it's a critical issue and uh, you know, it's difficult to be a doctor in the United States and it's difficult to be a doctor in, uh, in New York City, so we are committed to supporting our clinicians and uh, Dr. Long and Dr. Katz have a, a great recruitment campaign for primary care physicians. Uh, Docs for NYC is its name. There's YouTube videos and catchy flyers and uh, great things. We, we've got a, a tremendous advantage actually as health and hospital for recruiting physicians because uh, we have a mission and a patient population 
really like no other. The ability to really change the trajectory of people's lives through your care as a practicing primary care doctor uh, is unique in our system. And uh, the care that our clinicians who already work here have for the system, the commitment of the community to our system and the investment in it uh, is, a, is a really wonderful and important thing. And so, uh, you know, mission-driven doctors like that are uh, just looking for us to reach out and looking for us to make it easier for them to practice in our system. When you have an electronic health record that's very difficult to use, when you have outdated things like timesheets or people don't answer the phone when they call the clinic, these basic things that Dr. Katz and our whole team are so focused on fixing, uh, those are key <coughs> recruitment tools for physicians, and they're a critical part of transforming the system. Uh, they're, they're the bread and butter, they're the fundamentals, but they're really, really important. So I'd say direct recruitment efforts, uh, putting a lot more focus on that and getting out there and being visible with people uh, is one thing, and then making the system more welcoming and easy to work in, because uh, you know it's, it's tough to be uh, a doctor in any setting. I couldn't do it. I'm, I'm, I'm not a clinician. I don't pretend to be one, but uh, you know, doing everything we can to support them is a, is a key part of that effort. So you, um, in terms of, you mentioned in your testimony, you s in your testimony that between 2012 and 2014, health and hospitals experienced declines in hospital stays, losing nearly 5% or 10,000 of its hospital stays. So I would hope that as you focus on primary care, that you're seeing maybe people going to more community-based clinics, which is really what your Gotham Health Network is all about. And so um, Dr. Katz even identified the need to invigorate and expand primary care as the main priority of the h, &H system. However, utilization across the, the Gotham centers decreased by 5.6% in, in fiscal year 2018, with five of the six sites reporting fewer patients compared to the year before. So given the emphasis on addressing the primary care needs of families and individuals in their own neighborhoods, why do you think New Yorkers aren't utilizing the Gotham the system as much as we'd like? Yeah, I, I think it, you've identified a critical issue and something we are hyper-focused on addressing. Uh, I think a, a <coughs> one clear answer to, to that trend is, uh, is the physician recruitment piece, right? We've got to make sure we have the right number of staff, the right number of doctors and support staff in those facilities to welcome people and make it easy to get an appointment when you need uh, one. Um, We've got to have the systems in place to make it easy to get into the system and have it be coordinated. Um, for instance, I, my primary care doctor is at Bellevue, but there is a Gotham site closer to my home, and it wasn't easy for me to try to change my primary care doctor from Bellevue to that Gotham site. So we've got to do a better job at that, and we're working on things like that at our call center with Metro Plus and our other health plan partners. Uh, but leveling out that trend, which I think we're starting to see this year, the rate of decline is slowing, and we're going to move towards growth in the next year or so. But you've identified a critical challenge. We've got to make sure that we're growing our patient base in outpatient care by keeping the patients that we have. I mean, we have a, a loyal and important uh, base of patients, and so making sure it's easier to use our system and that we're executing on those fundamentals really is the key. So I've been trying to get to, to every hospital in the city, and I'm slowly making my way to every borough. Um, and I, a lot of the hospitals, of course, one way that the council can exercise its charter mandated responsibility of oversight is some of the capital funds that are going into some of these buildings. And for those buildings that are underutilized or that have space or maybe their emergency rooms aren't at full capacity, um, they are still looking to renovate and improve the facilities, which I think is absolutely necessary. Anyone who comes into a hospital should feel like they have one of the most beautiful hospitals in the city. And we do have some great looking hospitals, and of course Bellevue is absolutely one of them. But do you think that the, in terms of, of capital, so you have a, a, capital, commi a capital commitment plan, $2.8 billion in the fiscal year 2018 to 2022, with 90% of the porting, funding supporting hospital improvement projects. So how can H&H &H improve its capital plan, planning and spending to best address the changes in health care delivery, specifically the move towards outpatient services? And while I, I say this because in Woodhall they, were looking, they are looking to renovate their emergency department and expand. And I'm wondering whether that is the best use of funds considering the utilization of that room. Now there are other hospitals, and, and my, my colleagues are probably going to speak of the hospitals in their district that are at 
full capacity, if not over capacity. And so are you looking at each individual hospital and how you're spending these capital dollars? Because the one other thing that I hope that improves over the next few years is the transparency by health and hospitals in terms of your financial plan and even having a capital plan for the next five years. We'd love to see those numbers as soon as possible. Um, so, so how are you looking to use those funds in this shift towards outpatient care? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, you're, it's exactly right. You've got to look at it holistically, right? We have to make sure that the hospitals, which are such a critical pillar of our communities, have the services and infrastructure that they need to function well. Uh, and, but the council and the mayor have been very supportive in that shift towards outpatient care. So $100 million committed to new outpatient care sites. Uh, very excited about that. The Caring Neighborhoods Initiative, done tremendous work in building new outpatient facilities and focusing our resources there. Uh, so I look forward to working with you on the capital plan and making sure that we're looking at this holistically because I think you're, it, it's an excellent point. And we certainly want to make sure that our resources are focused on the direction that healthcare is going and that our system is going. Has the consolidation of the voluntary hospitals affected health and hospitals? I, you know, I think the healthcare market is evolving around the city and I'm certain that there has been change as patients move between facilities and facility footprints change. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't speak to the broader trends before I arrived. I, I came in from Los Angeles with Dr. Katz just uh, nine or ten months ago, although it feels like uh, we've, we've <laughs> been here a, a long, long time and, and uh, learned a lot from this community and, and feel so lucky to be a part of it. Um, but certainly health and hospitals is a critical part of the safety net and a, a pillar of the healthcare industry in the city. So any changes that happen in any borough uh, do have an impact on health and hospitals and what doesn't change, though, is our commitment to our patients and our commitment to serving everybody who comes through our door regardless of their ability to pay. So, uh, you know, our focus is squarely on that and on making sure we get our uh, internal systems and structures in order so that we're delivering that high-quality patient care and, and keeping ourselves on good financial footing. Well, let's, let's get a little specific, if you can. That was a very good general answer. Um, I wanted to ask, so we had a hearing at, um, in El Barrio about the future of psychiatric care in New York City, and a couple of things were brought up in terms of um, the Allen Pavilion at Presby eliminating behavioral health beds, and you know, to Mount Sinai, Beth Israel's credit, they are keeping uh, 200 behavioral health beds during this transformation, which is still scary, but they are keeping the behavioral health beds, which are sorely needed. And so. We had this hearing and we heard that there was a rise of inpatient psychiatric care at health and hospitals because we know when we look at costs and the bottom line that this is just something I feel like H&H &H has had to take on year after year. So have you seen an increase in any other inpatient services besides psychiatric care because of the change in the way the voluntary hospitals are, uh, what they're going through in their transformations? You know, I think that is that is a critical example and one that we're very focused on. Uh, you know, our, there are the trends in that service line are certainly more significant than I think in others, and um, I can get you a more detailed list of specific changes by service line. Um, but our commitment to behavioral health is there regardless of what our competitors are doing. And I know Dr. Barron was at that hearing uh, at uh, in El Barrio and. Uh, you know, he does a tremendous job and our clinicians are very focused on these, uh, on that service line and we will continue to be. So, uh, you know, our, our uh, inpatient facilities, it varies year to year. I think um, certainly emergency department and, you know, AM surge and surgery coming in through the EDs uh, have changed and increased in recent years. Uh, but again, uh, attributing that to specific changes in the market is uh, probably more specific than I can get in this setting right now, but I'm happy to follow up with you and, and dig into more details on it. So do you have any, like, numbers you can give us? I only feel, I say this, and Matt, you said you came from L.A., right? He, like... I didn't work with Dr. Katz No, no, he, LA, he called you. You got the call. I got the call. I got the okay, call. Okay, and that's, that's good. That, that you have a report, and I think that's important in terms of getting to work and, and as soon as we can. This is a big system, and there's a lot to fix. Um, and so uh, why I'm asking is because, you know, I've had a lot of conversations about Dr. Katz and I'm glad that he's at, at the hospital and he's seeing patients. I think that's important. So, you know, but you being here, you know, we've talked a lot about, uh, re you know, utilizing under, underutilized space and thinking about that. And, 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 I, and I know you said that you've seen some increases, but do you have any 
numbers, any data, because I made the comment earlier about transparency and having statistics and if you can maybe give us one example, if, sure. it's, if, it's, if it's surgery, if it's whatever it is. Sure, my, we can my, I'm happy to. My, my recall is not as, uh, it's not as precise as Dr. Katz's and he's got an encyclopedic knowledge of our facilities as a clinician, but i uh, got some notes here that I'll just, I'll, I'll give you that. One of the largest increases was, was cancer center services across our facilities. Uh, that's a 20,000 increase from FY14 to FY18. Uh, dental services and geriatric care have also gone up. Um, ophthalmology services are up. I can get you specific uh, details on those. You know, the most important decline in services that, that we've talked about is in primary care. Right? It's a big base of patients, uh, and that has gone down almost 12% since FY14. So that's the number that I'm most focused on. Uh, making sure we turn that number around, flatten it out, and, and uh, bring it up is, is a critical part of this. Um, and then I think you know you 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 draw out you drew out a great example, which is behavioral health. Uh, I think we deliver a tremendous amount of it, but there is an unmet need in the community for it, and finding new models to deliver that in a holistic way, connect people to the services they need. I think there's a lot of important ways we could use uh, our hospitals as uh, you know important parts of the community to connect people to those services and. Uh, you know, grow that service line in a sustainable way. So generally, cancer, dental, geriatric, ophthalmology are up, primary care down. Correct. Okay. I just ask that in the future, um, if we could, if you could bring some numbers so we could kind of be able to also, when we have a conversation with the voluntary hospitals and say, you know, there are real increases, we, you know, just saying there's increases, but having the numbers, you, you know, a lot, a, many conversations are data-driven, especially in healthcare. Absolutely. So I have some more questions, but I want to actually um, pa pass the mic to my colleagues to make sure that they are able to ask, um, ask you. So first I want to uh, acknowledge Council Member Levine. Okay. Thank you, Chair Rivera, for convening this hearing on such an important topic and for your incredible work chairing the committee. Um, and it's great to chat with H&H. &H. You know, these, these are times of tectonic changes in healthcare, as we've been discussing here, and H&H &H has been impacted deeply by that. And we're worried about the institution of our public hospitals because they are critical to life in the city. Um, they're also, by the way, critical to the voluntary hospitals. If H&H &H didn't exist, it'd be a huge problem for the entire medical system. And as, as the chair was, was, was very ably summarizing, there's almost no aspect of your work that isn't seeing an increase or a decrease or a transformation. You have inpatient, which was a significant decrease. You have smaller decreases in the community-based facilities. Um, emergency room use, I believe, continues to be quite robust. I'm not sure if it's increasing, but it's, it's, uh, it's intense usage. Um, and you have, you have uh, an inventory of buildings that were built anywhere from mostly 40 to 100 years ago. And I got to imagine that is creating a lot of mismatches. And in, in particular, I know that there are hospitals with uh, significant inventory of vacant inpatient beds. And I wonder if you could talk about that, the mismatch to the extent that you're experiencing it between um, buildings that, that, that you've inherited and the changing world of patient services. Sure, sure, I'm happy to. I, I think, you know, hospitals were built bigger uh, previously, right? Several hundred beds, I think Bellevue is 900 beds. Uh, and you know, that scale and size is certainly different than what people are building when they build a new hospital now. Uh, you know, from I think uh, our perspective, however, these are uh, critical community institutions, and uh, I don't look at it as much as empty beds or empty floors, but as critical space in a community institution where we can deliver health care of all kinds. Uh, and, you know, I, I come to health and hospitals from a, a health care system in California called Kaiser Permanente, which is built a lot on one-stop shops, right? So there is not a perfect singular model for how you should deliver health care, but having inpatient, outpatient, pharmacy, all kinds of variety of clinical uh, capabilities in one setting 
uh, does have value. So but sorry if I could just interrupt, but can, can, can you tell us like, what, what is the total census of beds currently in H&H, &H and, and on any given night, uh, how many could we expect to be empty? Well, I think we, you, know, you, you staff the facility to how many beds there are, and some units are, uh, are, are not actually waiting to be filled beds. Um, I can get you the specific census uh, at, a, at a given time. Right, I, the staffing issue is, is a separate question, and, and you're right to point out, of course, that if, if a unit is unstaffed, at least you're not incurring um, costs when there's no patients there. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that you have essentially taken whole floors out of use, and can you, can you quantify the number of units which have been essentially gone lights off uh, because of the un because you don't have need anymore. I can certainly follow up with you on that specifics. I mean, some of that it, it, it evolves and people spread out when there is a, a space in a facility, right? So we have a floor with one clinical capability that could be on a smaller setting if you needed it to. So uh, we're have we're looking at this across our facilities and evaluating, having architects look at every floor what is the best layout and potential for how things are structured. So I want to make sure I have good numbers for you and that we have that complete analysis done, which I'd be happy to discuss with you. Um, I, I look forward to having those numbers. There's not a single one of your 13 hospitals and, and dozens and dozens of other facilities that isn't beloved by its surrounding community and that doesn't play such an important role in, in and even the broader uh, socio, uh, sociological and cultural life of its communities. Um, so we, we would mourn the closing of any of your facilities. So sh when people hear that there are units which have been um, essentially uh, taken out of, of service because of the lack of demand, um, should we worry that then there's going to be buildings closed? No, no, no public hospitals are going to be closed. And I think okay. that's a, a thank you for, for bringing that out and, and, uh, and, and addressing it. I think, you know, it's important for our system for people to understand uh, that we have to find creative ways to use space. Uh, you know, a, a, a unit that is not fully occupied and used uh, does not mean that the public hospital is going to be closed. And so what, what would be some of the creative ways you could use that space? Yeah, I, I think, you know, new models of behavioral health care, right? So uh, finding ways to treat people uh, that gets them connected back into the communities in meaningful ways. Um, you know, we have extensive partnerships through our uh, performing provider system, One City Health, with community uh, benefit organizations that provide a variety of services to people. So finding ways to co-locate staff like that for social services to make sure people are connected into those uh, types of care, those are some things we're looking at. Um, and we, we, we have a shortage of, of every one of the services you described, particularly when it comes to serving um, those with mental health problems. We have a shortage of supportive housing. Um, I'm not sure if those facilities are candidates for something permanent like that, but it s sounds like what you might be describing is a transitional form of supportive housing maybe where someone who needs an intensive period of attention uh, from medical professionals uh, while living full time could get their life back together and then transition to a, a, a less intensive setting. Am, am I describing that correctly? That, that, that is one model. I mean, we've, we've looked at several of our facilities and have built actually supportive housing and, and structures like that. As I look at the Canva developments on Kings County, uh, work that's ongoing at Woodhull, uh, you, know, you have to be a little careful in terms of what you can build inside the four walls of an inpatient facility, right? You can't really have housing per se right. on a hospital floor. Right. Uh, but th we have space on the campuses overall. and. Uh, you know, making sure we're using all of the buildings as efficiently as possible to deliver the full range of community needs and uh, supportive needs for people's health is, is critical. And lastly, because I, I don't want to take up too much more time, um, I've asked you about the, the implications for your space of all these changes, um, and you've spoken about this in past hearings, but it's important to revisit. What are the implications for your workforce of, of th this changing mix of services and um, should we anticipate additional layoffs, uh, or perhaps are you actually adding staff to meet need in some critical areas? We're certainly adding staff in, in some critical areas. Uh, you know, primary care, revenue cycle, right? We're, we're, we need to be a much better billing operation, so there, uh, there, there do need to be significant staffing increases there to make sure we're 
getting bills out on time and doing everything we can to collect revenue for the system. Uh, you know, I think it's about uh, putting staff to use where the patients are and where we can serve people best, right? Their represented layoffs are not on the table. Our goal is to support our staff and, uh, you know, make sure we're delivering care that the communities need. If okay, so again, layoffs not on the table, is that what you table. said? Okay, that's a good note to end on. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Levine. You know, I just I just wanted to say we we um, in the last fiscal year, I think you had like a projected loss of 400 million, and it was it didn't end up being that. You ended up losing less. It was like 200 million, and from what I understand, your deficit is two billion, more or less. You you are in a you're very financially challenged. Um, health and hospitals is, and I realize that Dr. Katz is here to turn that away, uh, turn that around, in ways that are very simple, but also drastic in, in in terms of what Councilmember Levine mentioned, and really just utilizing this space, but also the billing and the coding and all the things that are not happening administration-wise, and and the reason why we're so um, adamant about asking for the data and asking for the numbers is because. You know, there are big changes coming to healthcare, and it is really, it, we, we know that a lot of that is on your system. And so we are also trying to be advocates for you in terms of having a system that is serving the underinsured and the uninsured. And so when, you know, council members are funding things like EKG machines, you know, we, we really want to know what's going on and why does it have to be this way. So I just really hope that you know going forward we, we do see some more uh, data that is very detailed and specific because if you were to show us you know the the cancer dental geriatric and, and the ophthalmology and the services and how that has gone up over time and we can say well during the same time these voluntary hospitals actually closed these departments or eliminated beds in this area we can start making direct correlations about how we need to do better in treating the public hospital system as part of our general infrastructure in a, in, in a more serious way so I, I just wanted to say that, um, and I also want to turn it over to uh, my colleague, uh, Councilmember Reno, so I know he has a question for you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I won't ask as many questions as Councilmember Levine. I'll be more short-winded. Uh, so we can, <laughs> no, it's, we need timers. We need timers, and it should be no more than a minute for Mark. Um, I, I disagree. <laughs> um, so, Speaking of the work that you're doing, I, I just want to speak to the type of person that I am, I guess, and how that plays into like the health and hospital system. Uh, I don't have a primary care doctor. Well, when I get sick or something happens, I go on like a website, find a doctor that can take care of me in the next hour or two, pop in, pop out, and just keep it moving, right? I get some cold medicine or whatever it is, and I'm good. I don't have any long-term relationship with any provider. Um, uh, so, and it's about time for me. Um, I need to be able to do these things quickly because I got to get back to work. Sometimes I don't even miss a day of work. I just miss those two hours where I need to see the doctor go in and out. Um, it seems like a part of your approach is dealing with that situation and knowing that you have more primary care doctors. Um, can you talk to me in two, two ways? Because I think it's important that who you are plays out in what you're doing, but also that you don't cripple yourself financially in trying to prove uh, a policy point here. Um, so can you speak to me how having more primary care doctors would, keep, would make it so that I can go there, or if it can be done in the same day or next day um, uh, when it comes to appointments, and two, financially, how does that work um, in your modeling? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, first of all, I, I have our vice president of primary care here, and right. he may I, just run up and I apologize. offer you a primary apologize. care visit right now because he's, he's that passionate about delivering care and meeting our patients where they are. So uh, that, that's one option. But we have uh, better ones for you as well. It, it, as, I think it's a great question, and you are exactly my, my target audience and target market for these things. You know, as part of our ambulatory care uh, transformation plan, one big thing we're rolling out is making sure that people have can schedule same day or next day appointments with their primary care doctor. Now that sounds simple and basic, but the, the, the way it addresses both parts of your questions, uh, I'll get at right now. First of all, 
you want to be able to see your doctor because it's, you don't want to go in and explain all your history every time to a new person, right? It's an extra 15, 20 minutes of a visit. If you've got precious time to waste, even if you can schedule it somewhere else, you want to go into someone that knows you, knows your medications, knows what you need, knows your history, and can really help you stay healthy. That makes it a worthwhile visit and not just someone saying, here's some cold medicine, that'll be $300, see you never, right? That's not a good patient experience and not what we're focused on. So uh, all of our scheduling systems and our uh, attribution of patients are now going to be dedicated to making sure people see their one primary care doctor anytime they come in. And the way we'll accomplish that is a couplefold. One is improving our data system so that we're tracking this better. Another is leaving 30 plus percent of every physician's scheduling visits open for one or two day visits so that Council Member Reynoso calls up and says, you know, I'm not feeling well, I need a visit tomorrow. You don't get the answer of, sorry, you can see this primary care doctor who you've never met before, or you can see your own doctor in two months, right? That's not the experience you want. We want to be able to deliver that same day appointment every time. Uh, and, you know, financially, it, the more loyalty people have to their clinicians and the more they're coming in to get ahead of these healthcare issues, uh, it, you know, generates some revenue on the front end from the primary care visit. That's one part of it. Really, the bigger value is in uh, our risk-based contracts and in the quality performance bonuses we get down the line, right? If we control uh, a patient's diabetes over time, that measure has a tremendous impact on what we're paid by managed care plans by the state. Uh, if we, if you know to call your primary care doctor instead of coming into the emergency room, avoiding that ER admission can be tens of millions of dollars for our system. Uh, and you know that that's it's really critical. And so um, those are some key ways we're focusing on it. So I really look forward to seeing how this plays out. And we will get you a primary care doctor at Woodhull or wherever else you would like. We'll, we'll <laughs> make it happen by the end of the day if needed. Yes, if I'm getting a point, I'm gonna be talking to Carlina and say I, they want me to wait a week. Cough, cough, <laughs> it's not gonna work. Um, not gonna but, happen. <laughs> so then, how does? And my last question is just the community-based outpatient model, right? Uh, how does that, how do you, how do you benefit from that? Or well, I guess you waste less funding having to take care of patients, inpatient work, um, because that's very expensive and usually not it, it, unnecessary in some cases. So I guess, am I, am I understanding why an outpatient model would work, uh, a community-based outpatient model would work, even if those clients are not coming to uh, health and hospital yeah, I think facility? That, I think that's one part of it, right? I think uh, the, the structure of reimbursement for health and hospitals, for hospitals overall, particularly people who treat Medicaid patients, is changing from a model of do the most, do the most expensive and intensive things and we'll pay you for it, to keep people healthy, keep them out of the hospital for unnecessary things, and we will make you whole for that. And we are completely committed to that, not only because it's the right thing to do financially, but it's the right thing to do for our patients. Doctors don't go into medicine to say, oh, I really want to perform invasive procedures on people all the time. Right? It, they do it because we want to help people stay healthy and uh, you know, stay out of the hospital, which can be a traumatic and difficult and sometimes dangerous experience for people. Right? So uh, we, that's the reason to do it, and the changing model of reimbursement really can help us do that. So we're f very focused on that. Thank you for those answers. Um, I appreciate it, and thank you, Chair. Thank you. But before I turn it over to Councilmember Moyer, just a quick question. How long to get an appointment? at health and hospitals? Currently our third next available appointment has come down from about 18 days to about 14, uh, 13 or 14. So it's an improvement. Uh, you know, I think the, the real measure I want to see is how many unique primary care patients do we have in a year, right? Is that number starting to climb as people feel like this is a valuable and important way for me to get care at health and hospitals and stay connected to health and hospitals? Uh, I think that appointment time number is a very good one, and I want to continue to see it improve. But really growing the base of primary care is, is a critical part of it. Okay. Council Member Moya. Thank you, Chair Rivera. Uh, thank you. I just have a quick question, and correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't, when it was H HHC, didn't we have community-based health clinics throughout? Correct, yep. And then wound up closing them? Because, like, I remember in Queens, 
we had several community-based health clinics that were an expansion of Elmhurst Hospital in the Queens Health Network. They had them running for and operating for a number of years, and then they closed. And the objective was the same as what you're talking about now. And I'm just trying to figure out what, what the difference is in this model that you're presenting than the model that failed and closed down all the health clinics that were in the surrounding areas. Yeah. And maybe you can walk me through that. Well, I, you know, I, I, I can't speak to the operations and structure of how those were run and what the specific history was. I can tell you our, our strategy going forward and why we think it will work this time. Some of it's uh, our responsibility. And I get that, but I think it's important to understand the difference, right? I, yeah. I hear that you're telling me how we're going forward, but there was about six or seven in Queens, and then they closed. So what I want to know is, how is that going to be different? And what was the reasoning why they failed or the closures? Was it budget cuts? What was it? And how do you see this is going to be a different model? Because everything that you're saying here yeah. is exactly what was presented last time. OK. Well, I, 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 um, I think the, the key difference, there are two. One is the way healthcare is paid for has changed and will continue to evolve. And that changes the financial model of an outpatient-based community setting like that. That's number one. The number two thing is our new clinics, the goal is really to have them be full service clinics. So we're not just pure primary care, stop in and you can have a visit but very little else. We'd like to include pharmacy, behavioral health care, some imaging services, and that full scope primary care in a clinic setting. So it's you know, more of a holistic set of services. You can come in and not just have a primary care visit, but get a series of other services that make it a more valuable and you know, uh, important experience for folks. So I, you know, I, I don't know the specific history of all the centers in Queens. I'm happy to you know, talk but I'd, I'd love to get that absolutely back because that that's that's key. And what and just so I'm following you, are you saying that uh, all of those services are going to be in house? They're not going to be uh, uh, then pushed to the local hospitals that are around there for uh, whether it's imaging services or follow or follow ups. Again, it depends. It's a great question. It depends on the size of the clinic and the 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 proximity to a hospital, right? Uh, Elmhurst has a tremendous array of services that they offer, uh, and we wouldn't want, wouldn't want to detract from that at all. Elmhurst is a very busy hospital, though, and uh, I want to make sure that uh, they are doing the absolute best and highest value care they can offer, right? They have the ability to do amazing surgeries and, you know, intensive inpatient care that you could never do in an outpatient setting. So making sure that, you know, our facilities with the highest capabilities like that are being used for services that uh, can only be done there and are reimbursed at that level is important. And so some services will stay in-house at those community centers, even though hospitals like Elmhurst will have uh, those uh, capabilities as well and will be able to perform those services when people arrive at Elmhurst for a primary care visit. We're certainly not going to close primary care at any of our hospitals, right? It will always be an option at the hospitals. It's just a question of do people have another setting to go to so that our hospitals can be uh, less crowded and able to deliver services they only offer at hospitals. Right. No, I, I, I understand that part. Okay. What I'm saying is what you, were, what you were saying that this is different than what was in the past, you're describing exactly what we did back then. So everything that you're saying we're doing differently now is what they did before, right? And so that's why I'm just still not seeing why it's going to work now other than you telling me that formulas are changing in the method of which uh, health care is paid for, Yeah. right? So that if, if we can get back to the committee and to the, to the chair, I, I think it would be very helpful Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. to understand that. Uh, I, I will say on a side note, Elmhurst Hospital does provide great care. My mother had surgery there on Friday. Uh, the doctors, the nurses, everyone there uh, has been uh, a tremendous uh, support. Uh, I can uh, vouch for the great work that is done in our public hospital system that you trust your mom uh, to go there uh, and have surgery and be well cared for. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, I appreciate uh, the time.
Thank you. When someone goes into um, an emergency room, rather than going to one of these uh, community-based clinics, can they go into an emergency room, be diagnosed, and then see a specialist? And why I'm asking is because though it may take only 14 days to get an appointment, sometimes with a specialist it takes much longer. So why I'm asking is while we want to encourage people to make appointments and you know, take advantage of, of the world-class care that h and provides, how do we discourage or I guess motivate people to use more local um, care rather than going in and, and, and getting it all done in the emergency room? Mm -hmm. I, I think it, it, it's a great point and it speaks to a, a key philosophy of our primary care expansion and, uh, and this effort and that's to meet people where they are, right? People don't go to the emergency room uh, for no reason. They go because it's a, it's a fast way to get access to certain types of care sometimes. Now fast can mean waiting four or five hours and then getting a scan and no one, that's not the type of care anyone wants to deliver. Um, the, the key to I think what you're saying also is our e-consult system and so getting in to see a primary care doctor whether it's same day, next day, or if you don't need it in 14 days, being able to get a specialty visit, essentially, get the opinion of a specialist on your condition within a few hours or a couple of days, which we can do through our e-consult system, and we're gonna scale up across the entire system, uh, is critical to making that experience more valuable to people. Uh, because you're right, if it's a choice between waiting in an ED for five hours to get a specialty appointment, or being told, I'm sorry, no one can see you for two months in a primary care setting and another two months to get a specialty visit, that, that's not a hard choice. You, you, you would do the ED. So we've got to make it easier for folks to get the care that they need in an efficient way in a different setting than the ED. And when uh, Councilmember Moya mentioned um, how the centers had closed and not trying to repeat what is what clearly is a cycle that is loses money, it's unproductive, it's, it's, it's just um, inefficient. How are you getting the word out about the the Gotham network? Because you know, I, I mentioned that there was a decline in visits, the, that they decreased by 5.6 percent. Are you reaching out to immigrant communities? Are you letting them know that these services exist? How are you working with community-based organizations? Uh, we certainly are. We certainly work through the community advisory boards as well. I, I view them as a key uh, entree into the community and connection point. Um, uh, Councilmember Moya, Elmhurst is a great example of this. They do a program called Walk with a Doctor. They bring their doctors out into the community and uh, you know, give walks with people to talk about the services that Elmhurst offers. I think creative ideas like that are, are critical at every institution. Uh, you know, We are the public system, so we don't have a marketing budget in a big way that we spend on things like this, but we do try to reach out in targeted ways to communities, particularly immigrant communities in the appropriate language uh, and you know, spreading a message that we're here, we welcome everybody regardless of their status, their ability to pay, and we have this great set of services. But we've got to do a much better job of, uh, of communicating that and being clear about what we offer and where. So I'd love to work with you on that and, and spread the word around. Roberto Clemente is a great idea, great, great example, right? Very connected into the community, uh, making sure the word uh, about what they offer is available everywhere and, and, uh, and people know about it is a, is a key priority. What's e-consult, forgive me for, forgive my ignorance. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm so deep in the weeds here on it. It's our, it's our electronic consult system. So what it is is it's the way we will do specialty referrals in the system overall. And what it is is it's a, a pretty simple technical platform where you come in to see a primary care doctor and uh, the doctor says, um, okay, sounds like you're having you know, issues with your chest. Let me take a listen. I'm only a primary care doctor, I shouldn't say only, I'm a primary care doctor, so I don't have the ability to, to diagnose exactly what that is. I'm gonna type up your notes, share your record with a pulmonologist at a neighboring hospital. It goes through essentially an email platform. The specialist is able to pull it up, look at it, and get right back to the primary care doctor with, actually, that's not a serious issue, get the person on this medication, and if the issue doesn't resolve itself, they should come in for a specialty appointment in a couple of months. 
or the clinician can say, okay, actually that does look serious. Please have the person come see me tomorrow. And this is up and running? It's up and running uh, at I believe nine of our 11 hospitals, at least one clinic right now. And the goal by the end of next year is to spread it much further and have it at every single hospital. I ask because I have um, another concern and I, I think uh, in the future we'll, we'll probably have a hearing, a joint committee hearing with the Committee on Technology about e-records and the implementation. And it hasn't been going re really that well. And, you know, the briefing that I received has a lot of the e-records kind of systems working in silos and they're not all clearly connected, even across the 11 acute facilities. So how are you, in order for the e-console system to be successful, but your record systems are not talking to each other, how is that working? Uh, right now, it is working separately from the individual electronic health record systems. It's just a direct connection between doctors and notes and clinical records can pass regardless of what electronic health record system. Is it each. email? It's essentially email, yeah. It's, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a version of that. But it's a, it's a platform that lays out in a targeted way so that doctors can read and reconcile medications and look at these things, share images, x-rays, MRIs, things like that. Uh, but it's, you know, Dr. Katz rolled it out in LA. It reduces specialty overcrowding by 30%. It's going to have a critical role in our system. So it's another one of these things. But you're exactly right the electronic health record systems getting ourselves on a single clinical platform and a single financial platform is an essential goal of the next 18 months at Health and Hospitals. In the next few weeks, I think October 20th, we roll out EPIC, which is our new electronic health record system. Very exciting. Uh, on uh, the clinical and financial side at Elmhurst, Queens, Coney Island, and Woodhull Hospital and a surrounding array of community facilities. Um, you know, making sure that's successful and then scaling it up across our other facilities throughout 2019 uh, is absolutely essential to, to that type of information sharing and being an efficient and high quality system going forward. So you're, you're very right to point it out. It's critical. So in, in 2018, uninsured adults comprised 25% of H&H's outpatient adult visits. Do you know how that compares to the amount of outpatient care that other New York City hospitals are providing? to the uninsured? I am certain that it is higher, but I can't speak to the specifics of what each individual private hospital provides. I'm gonna write down high up. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna ask Greater New York, when they testify, I'm gonna ask them, you know, in terms of how they provide, you know, services to uninsured, underinsured immigrant communities um, and see if they have some numbers for me. And I hope that, um, you know, again, next time we can talk a little bit more math. I, I, I apologize, I, just off the top of my head, I'm happy to share uh, some general numbers with you. So, uh, you know, our uh, uninsured uh, hospitalizations in, uh, were 35% of the uninsured visits in New York City. Our emergency visits were 49% of the uninsured visits in the city, and our clinic visits by some measures that were 71% of the uninsured visits in New York City. So those are, uh, those are numbers from our, uh, from our system and the uh, hospital cost reports of 2015. Uh, you know, we, it's, it's a critical part of what we do. It's um, you know, a number we focus on to make sure we're getting everybody who's eligible insured. Uh, that's a, a, an important effort you've heard Dr. Katz talk about and one we've been focused on and are starting to see some success on. Uh, making sure we sign up eligible people because sometimes if you don't ask people to sign up or you don't make sure they know uh, what they're eligible for, um, you know they won't they won't sign up and it will be an uninsured visit. So we've got to we've got to get better about that on our financial system. But it is a critical part of our mission. Can, can you just say that again because that you should have put that in your testimony. I think those numbers are very very important. But but I'm not running the show there. Can you you said in 2015? Can you you said. H and H provided in terms of uninsured New Yorkers probably up to seventy one percent of clinic visits. Of uh, the market share of uninsured visits at the clinic level, yes. And then forty nine percent. Forty nine percent of the emergency visits for uninsured. Did you say something else, or was those, those the only stats you had? Inpatient hospitalizations, thirty five percent. Okay. 
Okay, and I'm not sure if any of the other co council member Ayala. So, is there a mechanism that H and H uses to uh, track the effectiveness of ambulatory care for patients that just received, you know, had a procedure done um, and was sent home? Uh, yes, absolutely. We we track clinical quality measures uh, across the board. Um, we have a care management program that follows people after they receive uh, care at our facilities, particularly if they've been high utilizers of care in a lot of different settings, uh, and we try our, our best to track that. As the chair pointed out, the electronic health record systems we have and our internal data capabilities make that a challenge, but it's a key focus of ours to track people after they leave the hospital, make sure we're following up with them. Uh, and preventing them from coming back to the hospital if they don't need to. We want to make sure that we follow up with people in the efficient way and get them into primary care to stay healthy and stay out of the hospital if possible. And what is that tracking data suggesting? Are we on the right path in terms of, you know, the way that we're approaching uh, clinical care? Uh, or have there been complications? I mean, I, I mentioned it because I had uh, three years ago, I think, or so, I had my uh, thyroid removed. and. You know, even for, for me, you know, I'm, I'm busy, as, as Antonio mentioned, not necessarily taking the best care of myself. And I need, I, you know, I have a nodule, I have to have biopsies, get my thyroid removed. I study it, I research it, I hear I may have to spend the night because I'm having the whole gland removed. And then I get there and they're like, you're going home today. And I felt like I was dying. And I didn't understand why I was being sent home. And I hear this a lot from my constituents who feel like they're being rushed out of the hospital before they feel mentally prepared. So is there uh, some sort of like maybe campaign that better educates uh, patients on, you know, what the new process is and why, you know, certain, uh, you know, procedures require that individuals now, you know, go home the same day and follow up, you know, later? Mm. Yeah, well, we have, it's an important thing in making sure patients uh, understand the instructions they're being given and the course of their treatment is a critical issue for all hospitals and I think something American healthcare generally does not do that well at, right? It, doc, you can forget that it's a scary place to be when you're in a hospital, right? It's, you, clinicians and uh, administrators can forget uh, that anytime someone's in a hospital, it's potentially one of the scariest days of their lives, we have to be sensitive to that and make sure we're paying very close attention and communicating clearly and slowly with folks and making sure they have the time to ask the questions they need to ask. So, you know, I think a way we really focus on it is we have uh, extensive social work departments uh, that work in discharge planning at all of our hospitals. Um, that care management function is something that we uh, are investing in and need to focus more on and make sure we're doing good follow-up care for people. Um, but I, I completely take your point. It's a it's a challenge across the healthcare industry, and something that I know we need to do better at. Yeah, I, I, I agree, um, and I want to thank the nurses because they they are oftentimes on the front line, and you know. Uh, have to deal with patients like myself who are a little bit confused and maybe still sedated and being sent home crying. Um, but uh, last question regarding uh, the current financial uh, issues that HHC is facing. Does HHC currently have a list of properties that may be underutilized uh, that could be used as a mechanism to, uh, for generating revenue in the future that you would be able to provide to this council? Uh, I'm happy to discuss it. Yeah, I think our, our, our footprint of facilities is, is certainly public record and uh, happy to get into more details and, and talk more about. Yeah, I'm specifically properties. interested in like properties that are like underutilized right now. We had, for example, in East Harlem, we had the Draper Hall facility that was current was being used at some point for housing for nurses, and then after Sandy, the building, you know, um, underwent um, massive flooding. Uh, there was mold and mildew and couldn't be used, and then at some point was transferred over to a private developer. Uh, for 100% uh, affordable housing, which I'm really excited about because we desperately needed that. But I also saw it as a understanding the finances of Metropolitan Hospital and how important it is in my community to keep that hospital there um, and readily available to provide services to the underserved and to the uninsured. Um, why the hosp why HHC kind of missed the opportunity to also, because it was an adjacent property, to develop it in a way that would generate revenue for years to come. 
Um, we have another property that's also, I think, three parcels, two of them which are owned by the city, HHC, um, uh, right now across the street from the same hospital where sanitation is housed. Sanitation is, we're in, we're in conversations to move that garage uh, to another part of the district, and that means that, that that property will be vacant at some point, and I wonder if there's any future, con if there's any conversation about the future of that property, um, and how is HHC really prioritizing um, these, these, you know, vacant, uh, these opportunities, right, uh, yeah. to, to create just further revenue? Well, we, we'd, we'd love the opportunity to work with you on it. I think you're, you, it's, a, it's a critical point. Uh, we need to use all of our land and structure to advance the cause of the public health system. And that's providing patient care, that's providing housing options and community benefits in the area, and it's generating revenue. All of those things make the health system more sustainable and uh, can help improve the health of the community. So we'd love to work with you on that. And so we can expect to see the list. Happy to. Thank you. We've been joined by Council Member Eugene. Um, I wanted to ask uh, about um, something that Councilmember Ayala brought up that I think a lot of people wonder about in terms of how you spend so much less time in a hospital, which is, as you mentioned, a benefit in terms of getting better at home and you're less at risk to get ill or, or exacerbate whatever symptoms you have. But is there a financial incentive to release people the same day in terms of how you're reimbursed? Uh, in some cases, there there may be. Um, the the you know, there is a big financial incentive, I will say, though, for preventing readmissions, right? So uh, some ho hospitals have to do have to strike that balance of making sure you're not keeping people longer than an insurance company will pay for. We certainly struggle with that, right? Someone is admitted for a day or two, and if they stay a third day, no payment for that. You can only get paid for the first two. So that is an incentive for some institutions. Uh, you know, I think a, a key thing, though, is that readmissions question. If you send someone home too soon and then they're back within 30 days, uh, you know, hospitals are rightly uh, penalized for that, and uh, we need to do a better job of making sure we're preventing those unnecessary readmissions and providing you know, holistic care uh, along the continuum. Are people who aren't admitted um, provided with discharge planning? They are. Observation status might be what you're what you're talking about are people coming out of the ED. We try to do 100% discharge planning as people leave the ED, uh, emergency department. Uh, our emergency departments are some of the busiest in the whole country, uh, but it is a, a, a critical issue to make sure that we're following up with everybody as they leave, to make sure they understand the course of care afterwards, understand you should come back in for a primary care or specialty appointment in X number of days. Um, the ED is a critical opportunity to do that for people as they're leaving from there. But given uh, you know, the, the volume of people, the ability to do you know, intensive personal discharge planning like that is, is a struggle, but uh, something we've got to get better at. So um, I, I have one more question, because I do know that there are advocates here to testify, and I want to thank them all for their patience. And of course, Greater New York is here to testify as well. And, and it's about something I mentioned in my testimony which is DISRIP. And so how is Health and Hospitals involved in the DISRIP program? So we, thank you for that question. It's, a, it's an important program that's changing the way healthcare is reimbursed in the state. Uh, Health and Hospitals is the largest partner of the largest performing provider system in the DISRIP program. It's called One City Health. Uh, we're one of 169 uh, community partners that are a part of this PPS. And so we work together as a group to make sure we're improving the health outcomes of uh, the patients who are attributed to the system and reducing unnecessary hospitalizations uh, and hospital use uh, across all of the different partners in the PPS. So we're very involved and committed to it. What CBOs do you work with? What's the relationship like? So we work with a variety of CBOs across uh, across the city and across uh, different services. Um, as I said, there are uh, you know 169 from housing providers to uh, people who come into homes to check on people's uh, asthma and make sure that there's not a lot of dust or allergens that that aggravate things. There are um, food delivery services that are part of the partnership. So it's a wide variety. And the One City team meets with those partners on a monthly or more frequent basis uh, to make sure 
we're working effectively and efficiently together. But I think, uh, you know, increasing that partnership, uh, improving the communication, and uh, is a, a critical priority as uh, as disrupt continues. Have you gotten any feedback from the CBOs about how you engage with them? I think you know a, a key lesson I've learn from Dr. Katzen in other settings is you can never engage too much. It's always a good thing to be more connected to these community groups and to everybody that you're working with. The more communication you have, uh, the better understanding of what each side needs. Um, so I think there has been some desire for, for more communication and um, you know more transparency on how the flow of funds from the state through the PPS to the different community groups is working. And I know uh, our CEO of One City and his team are doing a tremendous job uh, of improving that and, and making sure we're as engaged as possible with those community groups. And how might the potential dissolution of the disrupt program affect the financial operations of H and H, and the larger New York City hospital community? Yeah, well, I think it's it's uh, it's critical that uh, policies that reward value-based care that encourage health systems to be more efficient in how they're delivering services continue. What form that takes uh, is uh, you know, above my pay grade and a, a state policy issue, but one that health and hospitals will focus on intently and, and cares a lot about. So our, our focus is on making sure that policies like that continue so that we can continue doing the value-based care, community-based care that uh, is best for people's health, uh, rather than going back to a fee-for-service system where we're competing on uh, you know, delivering the most and most expensive services. So uh, w it's critical to keep policies like that continuing. Well, I want to thank you. Um, I, I want to just stress again what a lot of my council members said, which is, you know, educating consumers. And I, I know you're a bit strapped for cash, um, but I really want you to consider us advocates for H and H, considering how much you have to take on in terms of serving underinsured, uninsured uh, patients, our immigrant community, and how the transition, or I guess the transformation of healthcare in the city, specifically by some of the voluntary hospitals, looks a very different way from your transformation. So that's, you know, that's why we are just so, um, we're going to be really just adamant about getting the numbers, the data, um, and again, our, our funding of simple things that we feel should be something that you have an abundance of um, really just causes us to pause a little bit and ask, you know, in terms of financial management, in terms of how you are, you know, pushing people to the Gotham Network to get that primary care by, by someone who's going to get to know them and their family is really important. Um, but, you know, we're only as good as the information that we have. And so I'm, I'm just going to ask again, and I'll ask you every single hearing. I'm going to say it every time. In terms of the transparency of, of, of the data and the numbers and the financials, you know, that's how we can hold each other accountable. So um, I want to thank you. I, I do encourage you to remain for, for the rest of the hearing, to hear from the advocates and to hear from some of the people here. And um, we look forward to some of the information that you promised to my colleagues. And we'll follow up with any additional questions. Absolutely. If I could make one other pitch for you, you reminded me of one thing. It is open enrollment right now for all city employees. Metro Plus is my health plan, is a health plan owned by health and hospitals. Uh, one way the council and everybody in the room can help is if uh, you want to sign up for Metro Plus this year, I think it would be a, a great for your health, for the health of health and hospitals and we'd be happy to connect you to any physicians in their network, uh, including Dr. Katz or Dr. Long or any of uh, the great folks in our system. So that's my one final pitch. I apologize for stealing the last word, but. Uh. I'm gonna have the last word. Okay. I'm gonna ask you to check out the op-ed that <laughs> Council Member Levine and I wrote about this very um, topic in Gotham Gazette. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you so much to both of you. I wanted to call up uh, David Rich from the Greater New York Hospital Association. Good afternoon. Mr. Rich, press that button. There we go. I think I have to call Dr. Katz for an appointment right this moment. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for having me this afternoon. My name is David Rich, and I'm an executive vice president at the Greater New York Hospital Association. 
As many of you know, Greater New York's membership proudly includes all of the hospitals in New York City, including the public hospitals and all of the voluntary hospitals, as well as hospitals throughout New York State, New Jersey, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. Um, I'm pleased to be here today to discuss the transformation of hospitals in New York City and the strong actions hospitals have taken to enhance the accessibility and quality of care provided to the communities they serve outside of the four walls of the hospitals. But make no mistake, there's no substitute for the inpatient, acute, highly specialized services, services hospitals provide. Unique among healthcare providers, hospitals are available 24 hours per day, 365 days per year, in the times of New Yorker's greatest need. And Chair Rivera, thank you so much for your words earlier today about first responders and about Bellevue being there for the people who were um, harmed by the fire this morning. Our sympathies go out to everyone who was involved. But that's what really constituents expect hospitals to do and to be and to be there for them to provide those acute care services in times of emergency and in times of need. And so, um, it's very important, I think, so often people say, shouldn't hospitals do more? And yes, they should. And shouldn't hospitals be doing this, that, and the other? And yes, they should. But this is something that I think is always critical to understand, that when constituents think of hospitals and their time of need, and when they're brought by an, uh, they're in an emergency and brought by ambulance, it's really sort of the, the, part of the, the types of services only hospitals provide are the ones that they're thinking of. Having said that, Hospitals are much more than providers of inpatient care, as you know. They're community-based providers. This has always been the case, as many of our hospitals have traditionally been the primary and specialty care providers for their communities, typically in, typically in areas of the city where access to private physicians' offices have always been limited. Our hospitals have maintained major ambulatory care networks, with a focus on providing care to the Medicaid population and to other vulnerable New Yorkers. Um, so often, um, traditionally, we've seen hospital clinics in inner city areas really be the only place that people have been able to get outpatient care because there are not that many private physician offices. Um, though that care has often been provided in those clinics with the help of residents, which is not always the best way of providing health care. And as I'll mention in a few moments, we're trying to change that over time so that that care can be provided um, in different ways. We are, however, in the midst of a nationwide revolution in healthcare delivery. And I think it's important to understand when we're looking at what's happening in New York City, this really is a nationwide change and revolution that we're seeing in healthcare delivery. These changes began before President Obama's Affordable Care Act became law in 2010. Hospitals ac across the country have for years been encouraged to integrate, part partnering with, and often actually merging with other hospitals, as well as integrating with other provider types, such as physician groups, clinics, and long-term care providers, such as nursing homes and home health care agencies. The integration has been encouraged by federal and state policymakers who, as you know, regulate the hospitals very heavily for three reasons. First, although I don't think this is the most important reason, but the first is efficiency. Public insurers like Medicaid and Medicare have reduced payments to hospitals, creating financial strain for hospitals, especially those that rely on those public programs for majority of their revenues. And we just obviously heard terrific testimony from uh, Mr. Ziegler about some of the struggles safety net hospitals have because of the fact that they are mainly funded by Medicare and Medicaid. Federal and state authorities are demanding that hospitals do more with less. And in addition, care that once was provided only in inpatient settings has, due to new and innovative treatments and technologies, moved outside of the hospital at a time when hospitals are also being incentivized to reduce unnecessary hospital admissions. This means less demand for inpatient beds and creates empty, underused, and therefore often inefficient units. Because actually when the units are empty, they still end up being heated somewhat. There still are capital costs that go into um, the fact that they are empty. And so there is an inefficiency just in the fact that they are still there. To address this, federal and state authorities have urged hospitals to collaborate and often to merge so they can reduce costs and enhance quality. 
Second and most important reason that the federal government and the state have encouraged these consolidations is access. Financially sound institutions have often been asked and in some cases required by federal and state authorities to merge with financially challenged institutions or to transform healthcare delivery at a particular site to ensure that communities, communities continue to have access to healthcare. Hospital mergers provide efficiencies, thus preserving access, but also make resources available to the previously financially challenged institution through investments by the financially sound partner and critically, government. In New York State, the Cuomo administration and your colleagues in the state legislature have provided much needed operating capital funding to help such mergers and transformations take place over the last few years. Now it's important to point out the goal of all of this activity is to, is to preserve access and quality for communities which without a merger or a transformation of a service, we're facing the prospect of hospital closure and the complete loss of healthcare services. And unfortunately, before we saw some of this planning done several years ago, a lot of hospitals just closed without any sense of what was going to come next. And I think what we've been trying to do in the state of New York over the last few years is to do things in a much more planful way with um, new partners who can come in and try and help manage a situation. It is important in these situations for hospitals, policymakers, and elected officials alike to understand the dynamics that necessitate change, to properly and fully include communities, and to educate communities and patients about why change is necessary, how quality will be enhanced, and critically, how care will be accessed during and after the transformation. You talk a lot about transformation today, Chair Rivera, and I think those, that communication is extremely important. It's also critically important that hospitals engage their workforce. The third reason we've seen a lot of this encouragement by the feds and by the state is that hospitals have been encouraged to integrate with other providers to enhance quality. As the at the federal and state level, policymakers have urged hospitals to work together inside and outside the hospital to reduce unnecessarily and costly readmissions to hospitals, but also to prevent unnecessary hospitalizations before they even happen. Policymakers have increasingly required hospitals to take responsibility for care provided outside the four walls of the hospital. And this has meant that hospitals must acquire physician practices and partner with freestanding clinics, other community-based organizations, nursing homes, and home health care agencies. Now while these trends began before federal health reform was enacted, the ACA greatly accelerated these trends by profoundly changing how the Medicare program pays hospitals with the goal of enhancing quality and efficiency. The, in my uh, written testimony, I go through a lot more detail than all of this, I promise I'm not reading the whole nine page testimony, <laughs> but um, I'll just mention a couple of them and there's a lot more detail and I'm more than happy to answer questions about them as we go along. But these Medicare changes include Medicare value-based purchasing, which Mr. Ziegler talked a little bit about earlier, readmissions penalties, uh, health information technology incentives, but also penalties for lack of communication across different providers, uh, encouraging the, uh, the creation of accountable care organizations, enhanced, advanced health community models, and also changing the way hospitals are, and other providers are reimbursed through what are called bundled payments. Now, starting in 2011, New York State responded to these profound changes, changes and took them a step even further by initiating major Medicaid reforms designed to improve quality and efficiency with a major emphasis on care management for all Medicaid beneficiaries. Later, as a condition of participation in the state Medicaid waiver known as the Delivery System Reform Incentive Payment Program, or DISRIP, as you mentioned earlier, hospitals and other providers were required to create large collaborative groupings known as preferred provider, I'm sorry, Performing Provider Systems, or PPSs. Nearly all of the hospitals in New York City are participating in DISRIP, as you heard from Mr. Ziegler before. Um, h and is a very strong participant, either as PPS heads, as members of PPSs, or both. And they're required, as a part of this program, to do a huge amount with other providers to prevent hospital readmissions, prevent emergency room visits, enhance primary care access, 
properly managed behavioral health, screen for diabetes, and on and on and on. And in my written testimony, I go through a lot of the, a lot of the examples of what DISRIP requires. And the primary goal of all of it is to reduce hospital use by 25% over five years by the Medicaid population. So as you can hear, we hear over and over again, whether it's the federal government, the state government, Medicare incentives, Medicaid incentives, all of the incentives are for hospitals to work to actually keep people from coming to them, <laughs> at least on the inpatient side. And the way to do that is to do more on the outpatient side and to partner a lot more with outpatient providers and also community-based organizations who help work on the social determinants of health. We've seen hospitals get much more involved with community-based providers, both through DISTRIP but also on their own to develop programs and partnerships with, with schools to improve housing quality so that people can stay in their homes, so that they don't have readmissions to the hospital, et cetera, and et cetera. So Mr. Rich, if you yes. ra wrap up, I'd love to ask you some yes, questions. Yes, absolutely. So we can get to them. Yeah. Just a couple things really quickly. Um, I do in the written testimony talk about what DOH has found has been some of the um, quality outcomes of DISRIP. Um, I don't think it's DISRIP alone because as you've heard, all of the trends from the federal government as well as from the state are to try and reduce um, hospital admissions and readmissions. But earlier this year, DOH reported that preventable readmissions have declined by 15.2%. Preventable emergency room visits have declined by 14.3%, and behavioral health pre um, preventable emergency room visits have declined as well. And just lastly, I know a lot of questions have been raised over time about, with all this transformation going on and all the changes going on, and additions of services, subtractions of services, movement of services, how is all of that regulated and how, what is the oversight? As you know, the oversight is at the state level, um, it's done through the State Department of Health. Um, your colleagues in the State Senate and the uh, State Assembly through the public health law have vested that um, responsibility in the State Department of Health and also with the Public Health and Health Planning Council, which I know you're familiar with as well. Not all service changes have to go through that public process, as you know. Um, but I do think that we have found that DOH does, they have, they're, extremely um, committed people who are trying very hard to make sure that before there's an approval of a service change that they understand what some of the access changes might be. Um, and they have disapproved many applications when they have been concerned about what access will look like after the change is made. Anyway, with that, I went on way too long, so I will uh, stop okay. there. I thank you again for having me. No, thank you so much for your testimony, and I'll, I'll, I should have warned you there was a clock, but it's okay. <laughs> so I want to, um, I have a couple of questions that I did ask of H&H &H that, that I'll somewhat repeat, and you were clearly here for the entirety of their testimony from what I saw, so yes. thank you for your patience. And they said a couple of things um, that I'd love for you to address you know, directly. But before we do that, you know, there's a lot of uh, discussion on costs and where you go to receive care and how much it'll cost you and the differences in networks. Yes. And so with certain hospitals having largely different costs in providing care to patients, how do we encourage patients to utilize services and networks in a way that doesn't saddle lower cost networks with one unrealistic patient populations? Like, how are you going about working to ensure that people are utilizing networks equally and that there aren't certain networks that are being, again, saddled with more of the, you know, certain kinds of care, un uninsured and underinsured populations. My question really centers around equity, you know, and making sure that, that, that um, there isn't, you know, this hospital that certain people don't go to in that hospital and, and how are you ensuring that that populations are, are served equally? That's a really good question. And I think, you know, in the current system that we have, a lot of it depends on the insurer and the insurer network that they have negotiated with different providers. And that's even true within the Medicaid population because as you know, almost all of Medicaid now is Medicaid managed care. There are different Medicaid managed care providers. Metro Plus obviously is a huge one. Health First is another. 
um, and they have contracts with hospitals for in-network care, um, and then other hospitals or other providers are out of network. Um, on the, when it comes to Medicaid, being in and out of network because there are very strong rules about not having uh, out-of-pocket costs, um, it's, not as, it's not quite as noticeable, but when it comes to the non-Medicaid population, it can be quite a difference. If you have insurance that allows, and you have a hospital that's in network, and you go to one that's out of network, um, the cost could be much higher for you because you went to an out of network hospital as opposed to an in network hospital. But that will depend largely on the insurance that you have and which hospitals they have actually negotiated, um, negotiated with. Now nearly all, if not all, of the hospitals in New York City are in Medicaid managed care networks. Um, many of them, and many of, uh, you know, many of them have their own, as does uh, Metro Plus, as was mentioned by H&H. &H. Others are, um, are partners in Health First, for instance. There are about 10 or 12 voluntary hospitals that are part of that network as well. So on the Medicaid side, for the most part, um, there should be access to uh, hospitals through their Medicaid managed care plans, and they should not be out of network. You know, in their testimony, H and H takes everyone. You know, regardless of status, of, of of language, they take every single person. And 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 for that, I think is a lot of why, besides some inefficiencies in in some administrative uh, capacities, but I think that's a large reason why. And even in my own district, when you walk along First Avenue, there is a lot of. Uh, talk on, you know, which people go to NYU versus which people go across the street to Bellevue. It's just something that happens all the time. This is a common conversation mm -hmm. that if you are poor, under, underinsured, uninsured, you're an immigrant, you speak English as a second language, you go into Bellevue, and, and certain private hospitals aren't as welcoming. And in fact, in H&H's testimony, they said many hospitals continue to compete for patients and base their business models on offering expensive tests, consultations with specialists, and elective procedures that may not deliver true value to the patient or the taxpayers. Do you agree with that statement? Do you feel like that your network is, is providing true value to patients? Well, just to remind you, H&H &H is also a member of ours, so we definitely uh, um, always make sure to uh, say that we agree with them. <laughs> but yes, uh, I think, you know, that is something that I think Mr. Ziegler talked about that we're trying to move away from. And it really is something that needs to be moved away from. And whether we want to move away from it or not, it's happening. Because not only the Medicare program, as I mentioned, is not going to pay any more for every single test you do or for every single procedure that you provide. Um, the Medicaid program is not going to do that either, and neither are, are um, private insurers. And so what we see, and this is laid out somewhat in the written testimony as well, what we see is moving from paying um, everyone for the most expensive thing, the most expensive test, um, and paying someone for every single person who comes into the room to see the patient separately. We're moving to sort of one payment for an entire uh, episode of care, for instance. So someone comes right before they come to the hospital until a while after they've left, there may be one payment for everything. And what that encourages is not doing everything necessarily, not doing unnecessary things, you need to still do the necessary things, and what usually payers do, and certainly Medicare does this when they have these types of payment arrangements, is they require quality reporting to make sure that you are actually doing what you need to be doing and you're doing enough. But the idea behind a bundled payment and behind those types of payments is to try and make sure that all the providers are working together to provide the best care and also the most efficient care. Because if at the end of the day you provided the most efficient care, then there might be some savings left over to reinvest in care for others who might need more and who, for instance, the payment is not enough for the care for that patient. So I think, you know, we certainly agree that that is something that we're moving away from. And I think we're only going to see an acceleration of the move away from that type of um, payment model and that type of behavior. You, you don't mention in your testimony some of the, I guess, the hospitals in your network, and I realize there is a mix. 
Um, can you speak to hospitals that I guess that you're representing in many ways, um, the hospital <coughs> networks that have changed recently, that is, that have been consolidated with another entity? So, you know, as I mentioned, we have as members every hospital in New York City, um, and there has been a huge amount of that act of network activity, if you will, um, a huge amount. And as I mentioned in my testimony, some of this is is very much encouraged by um, the federal and the state government, particularly when it had to do with uh, a more financially sound hospital partnering with one that was not financially sound. But also just on their own, a number of hospital networks have been growing and have added more hospitals to their networks. This is a nationwide trend, and actually New York has been somewhat behind that trend. You see in other parts of the country uh, hospital chains of you know hundreds of hospitals, which you don't see in New York State. Part of why you don't see that is that we don't have for-profit hospitals in New York State. Um, we have a prohibition against uh, publicly traded uh, hospitals in New York State uh, as they don't have a prohibition, I don't think, in any other state. And that's part of why you've seen those huge hospital systems uh, build up in other states. But you've seen uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of consolidation and a lot of network activity. And a lot of it has to do with what I said before, which is trying to uh, create better efficiencies. If you think of, when, of hospital care in the past, when someone went, you know, needed a knee replacement, for instance, they could be in the hospital for several days. Now it's an outpatient procedure. There, were time, there are some cardiac procedures which you used to be in the hospital for several days for, and now they're outpatient procedures. So there are inefficiencies from the standpoint of a large, you know, as Dr. Ziegler said before, a large, huge building um, that might have empty units, empty wards in it, and that has driven some of the, um, some of the need for um, combining and collaborating that we've seen, not only in New York City, but really across the country. So in your testimony, you, um, towards the end, and, and we couldn't get to all 12 pages, but the, you had the certificate of need process, and you mentioned DOH's role and how you feel like people look at it with a, you know, a, a, a lens that is, um, I guess beneficial in some ways, but I, I want to ask about the certificate of need process. And I want to ask how have your members engaged communities that are impacted by hospital consolidations and are forced to go through this process? Because many of the people that I speak to feel like the certificate of need process, b besides trying to demystify it or explain it, that it isn't really inclusive and it doesn't really engage communities. And so, in fact, that there are many ways to take the process and kind of, you know, manage it in a way that's beneficial to um, what some people feel are unneeded consolidations or unwanted consolidations in their communities. So can you talk to me about how have your ma members engaged communities and what feedback have you received from stakeholders about the process itself in terms of hospitals that have gone through it? Sure, absolutely, and I would, we would be the first to say it's a very complicated process, and it is a very long process for both the hospitals going through it and also for other stakeholders who are interested in it. Um, it is a state process, as mentioned, because it comes out of state public health law, which is, you know, it's the state that licenses hospitals and all other health care providers, and so they are the ones who have the responsibility for this. Um, as shown in the chart in the testimony, there are certain types of changes, additions, mergers, new providers cropping up that do require sort of full review and public review and public hearings before the Public Health and Health Planning Council. Um, I did mention in there that uh, reduction in services are not always required to have that kind of full FIPIC review. And that is something that a lot of questions have been asked about. Um, from my experience and from what I understand and in talking to our hospitals, um, and what we certainly think a best, is a best practice is that we think hospitals need to be early and often meeting with their community boards, not just their community boards, though you are on a community advisory board, I know, and that is as inclusive as it can be, but there are others, too, who have interests and have concerns but also with other community groups, 
Um, they should certainly be meeting early and often with their state legislators, with their city council people. Um, and the hope would be, I mean, these, are, these changes are very complicated, and I think your first question of the day was a very important one, which is, why is outpatient care necessarily better? And that's a question that most people on the street would not, well, they might not know to ask it, first of all, but they would not really you know, understand it. As I said before, when people think of hospitals, they think of, you know, shows like ER and 911 and, and also their own, their own perception of what, you know, when they've needed it or when their parents have needed it. They think of inpatient care. I mean, so, and so it's always a difficult discussion when it's deemed necessary by policymakers, a hospital, and other providers to downsize inpatient capacity. And that's why I think communication is very, very important. Um, Mr. Ziegler said before that Dr. Katz always says, you can't have enough communication, and I think that's really true. Because you might remember, although um, I'm a lot older than you, um, in the mid-2000s when the Burger Commission came about, which was a commission that was set up by the state. And it was set up because in health policy circles, it had been for years said there are way too many hospitals in New York State. And there are way too many in New York City. And they need to, they're inefficient, and they need to either close or downsize or merge. And they came up with a list. But when then the public heard about the list, they said, well, what do you mean there are too many hospitals? We don't, we don't understand that. We don't know what that means. We don't know what you know, a hospital being too big means. We don't know what it means it has become inefficient. And so I do think it's incumbent on all of us to have these conversations like we're having today. Um, to help people understand, and, and why I said in the testimony that no amount of sophisticated analytical tools can substitute for having those community conversations so that people can understand what the plan is, where care is going to be provided, not just after the transition or the transformation, but during that transformational period as well. And I do think, you know, some, some of this is tough because even at the end of that period, if something's different and there's been a change, that's often hard for people to accept. And I think we will always see situations where people would have preferred what used to be than to what is now. But I do think we are undergoing, as I mentioned before, some real revolutionary changes and we have to figure out how to manage them best and communicate the best that we possibly can. So I wanted to talk about maybe one specific example you could give of, of a hospital that has gone through a consolidation and how that impacted the adjacent community surrounding it and what that process was like. But if you, if you can't think of an example, I will give you an example. Um, one of them that it's, it, right now, and I mentioned in my testimony two hospitals. One was St. Vincent's, which to me, and, and again, um, I, I was around during the mid-2000s, by the way. <laughs> um, St. Vincent's was kind of like a, it closed overnight compared to Mount Sinai Beth Israel, which is taking a little bit longer to close. And I, I wanted to, you mentioned, uh, you know, g being engaged with the community and communicating, but I think that that piece is what's missing it, with so many of these hospitals. And so we hear that they're eliminating 200 beds here and that they're closing a facility and it's going from 800 beds. Oh no, 800 beds is, we don't really have all those beds filled. We only have 400 beds. Now we're down to 300 beds. You know, some people feel like that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like you're gonna continue to cut the beds to meet the needs of the transformation that you envision as an organization, not necessarily led by the community. So. Can you give me an example of maybe um, a, a hospital that went through a process that you feel was truly community-led? And were the public hearings engaging? Did you, did you have good ideas that came from the advocates of things that you considered or you changed throughout the process? Because sometimes people feel like even when you come and you present to the community board and you have a slideshow and you have a handout of the slideshow, that's all it is. It's a slideshow with a Q&A and then you walk out the door and nothing else happens. So we're, we're trying to hear from you that not all hospitals create their plan in, in the way that they want and are just looking for a rubber stamp. 
that you truly want to hear from the advocates and the people who are living through this every single day? Well, I think, and you know, I, I'm not nearly as close to these individual examples uh, as obviously our member hospitals are because it's, they're the ones um, living through them. I mean, I do I think wish, that- I wish they were here today. I don't, I don't see them. Yeah, well, I think, you know, one of the, one of the um, issues uh, I think for them is, you know, I think, I think it, it varies a lot. And I think, you know, I don't believe that any one of them would say that just coming to a community board and doing one Q&A and one slideshow should be sufficient. And, you know, they need to be, and I think they strive to be, and if they're not, I think they know that maybe improvements can be made to be dealing with the community in a way that these conversations are ongoing. And that they're not just with particular people who sort of, you know, always show up to a meeting, but with the different community groups that, they're, that um, access the hospital and work with the hospital. Um, I do think that, um, you know, the other, the other point to be made is that they don't get to just do these plans on their own. Um, you know, the state government has a huge role to play. Um, I do hear you when you say it's not that easy to figure out like when FIPIC is having hearings or when they're, you know, how they're exactly uh, meeting and making their decisions. But, you know, that's a process that, you know, potentially could be improved over time. But I think that, uh, as we've seen in the past, they actually will disapprove plans if they think that they are not actually being um, serving the community and that they think there will be a diminution of services. Do you have um, an example of one, a, a plan that was disapproved? Yes. So you might recall a number of years. <laughs> this was probably the most publicly obvious one that I can remember. With Long Island College Hospital back in the day, they had asked to, because they had, they were bleeding money, they had asked to actually discontinue maternity services because they had a huge medical malpractice bill that they were not going to be able to continue to pay if they continued maternity care. There was a big outcry not just from the community, it's not only the community that has an outcry often, it was you know, physicians providing those services at that hospital, um, certainly uh, wor the workforce. And so the state said, no, you can't do that. Now, in that unfortunate situation, I think that decision contributed to the decline of the hospital, as we know that hospital doesn't exist anymore. Um, so that's one example. Now, I think what we've seen in that situation, as well as in St. Vincent's, in Westchester Square, and a number of other places around the city, where there was a full service hospital before, what the state has tried to do is make sure that there are healthcare services that remain there. There are places in the city where hospitals closed prior to um, the ones I just mentioned, where there was not a plan to have any services provided there afterwards. And they are unfortunately often, as you can imagine, a lot of times when a hospital closes, it's in one of the most underserved areas of the city. And there was not a plan to make sure that there was even still a freestanding emergency room the way there is at St. Vincent's or the way that there is at Westchester Square or the way that there is um, at former Long Island College Hospital site. So I think that's the kind of thing that we're seeing more of now is trying to make sure that there are still services there. It's not gonna be all of the services necessarily, and that will also cause some community concern. But I think now we're in a situation where we're having a lot more planning going on than we've seen in the past. Well, you know, I'm, a lot of the people that are here I've, I've worked with around this issue and, um, it, you know, I, I, Lich was an interesting example to bring up because it's, it's not even there anymore. But I, I want to just stress that I, I hope that you'll stay for the remainder of, of the hearing because not only have they been patient, but there are many people here that have a lot to contribute about some of your comments and how the whole certificate of need process goes about in terms of truly engaging the community. So I guess, you know, I, 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 I thank you for your testimony. Um, in case, do you have any questions? 
Um, and again, I really do hope that you stay uh, to hear from some of the advocates here because we have, we are really trying to work to, to provide quality services and you know, we're really, really um, anxious about the future of healthcare facilities and we understand that maybe you don't need 800 beds on every corner, but the way that some of these hospitals are closing and this land is being disposed of for, you know, uh, amenities and, and benefits that are not for the public, it is really disturbing. Um, so I hope that we will stay in touch in terms of um, some of the work that the hospitals are doing. It, it, it disappoints me that there aren't any voluntary hospitals here unless I'm missing them that can speak to some of the processes that they're going through, specifically the, the Mount Sinai Health System. Um, and th thank you, I thank you for your testimony for answering all of my questions. Sure. And with that, I'm gonna call up uh, a panel. It's going to be Lois Utley, Judy, Judy Wessler, Arthur Schwartz. And then this last three. Okay. Yes. And again, I want to thank you all for waiting. Um, I, I, I was hoping that you uh, would have the patience to uh, listen to the testimony, and I do um, value your input on anything that was mentioned uh, during the previous uh, panels. So I guess if we can start. I'm Lois Hutley, yes. Uh, Judy asked if she could go first. She has to leave. And, oh, um, well, yeah, bow you to can go first. Is is five minutes okay if I put the clock on? Okay. Well, Judy, you know, well, well so by wink, you have a. Bit. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, I, I just I wasn't going to testify, but just hearing, I don't know. How's that? Um, I don't have written prepared testimony. I just jotted down some notes, um, and. Uh, I must say, I mean, there, there are examples of uh, alleged movement from hospital to ambulatory care, and I say alleged uh, advisedly. Uh, both, for example, Mount Sinai, Beth Israel, and NYU as well. Let's not forget their encroachment as well. <clears throat> um, or setting up some of these clinics or offices in around the community and saying that that's what they're doing to adjust for the fact that they're removing other services or closing beds. <clears throat> um, for the most part, they are uh, considered private doctor's offices and not necessarily part of the hospital and therefore not required to take Medicaid and certainly not take care of the uninsured. Um, and um, that has a tremendous impact uh, in terms of access within the community. Uh, the um, <clears throat> um, NYU just opened an Essex Crossing in your, a little bit down from your uh, catchment area and uh, is supposedly not taking uh, Medicaid. Uh, Mount Sinai, Beth Israel, um, on the west side, for example, uh, there are a lot of what we call dual eligible patients. They have Medicare and Medicaid, and people are being told that they can use the service, but they will not take Medicaid so that the person who is low income would have to pay the, the you know, uh, copayment, which of course they can't do. So it's limiting access to care while claiming to be expanding care in the community, uh, which I think is a very serious problem <clears throat> and probably is happening in other places. Those happen to be the ones 
um, that I know about, and that's uh, very serious. Um, there are places, um, like Mount Sinai has set up a wonderful uh, joint program with a Denver facility for, for asthma and treatment, and, and they don't take Medicaid. Uh, and when I asked about it, uh, I was told that, well, the Medicaid patients can go to the clinic, even though, again, they're, you know, like three blocks away. <clears throat> the same is true for, I had an experience at the NYU um, Infusion Center. I'm a Gouverneur patient, and I was referred there from Gouverneur to Bellevue to NYU. I was very nervous about going there because I don't love them. Um, so I brought a friend who happens to be an African-American woman nurse, and she was the only person of color in the whole facility. Uh, again, you know, they, they, the, I want to say racism, but, you know, it, it really is racism and, uh, and a lot of other things that we could call. So that's a serious problem. Um, <clears throat> in terms of DISRIP, um, you may know I am a, the assembly representative on the state legislative, uh, I, it's called the pay op. I always forget what it stands for. But um, <clears throat> there was absolutely no intention of contracting with community-based organizations and moving services out. That was something that was pushed and forced and is a little bit happening, but certainly is not happening the way um, that it should be happening. And so, um, again, you know, even though there are these potential mechanisms to, to change what happens and maybe move towards equity, um, if it does happen a little bit, it's only because of a huge fight and not because it's something that's, that uh, the institutions are really interested in doing. <clears throat> there was an ambulatory care committee of the pay up and I don't even know what happened to it. It sort of disappeared because, you know, they really weren't coming out with a plan and demanding from the, the PPSs, which was the preferred provider systems, which were primarily hospitals. You'll give me a little more time, right? Um, that <laughs> primarily hospitals um, were not really responding with ambulatory care plans even though, again, when you transform a system, that's part of what the trans transformation uh, should look like. Um, and just to, to tie a little bit together, uh, money makes a difference. Um, and right now, we have the issue of uh, charity care. Uh, the, and there is a work group that was set up by the state to see about moving some of the money around in charity care, and that would help to pay for uninsured care. Um, I did a, a, a spreadsheet that shows that the, uh, there are essential safety net hospitals that are not getting much money from these charity care pools, but are providing way more of the care for the uninsured as well as for Medicaid patients. Um, this is an issue that's uh, quite ripe right now, um, and this work group um, is supposed to come up with a proposal in December, and I wanted to say this here because we could certainly use the support of the city council, and I'll be happy to share the information that we've developed in terms of seeing that that money should go where it should be going for paying for care rather than $10 million or $4 million salaries for executives, which is some of what's happening now. And some of the hospitals like NYU, because they bought a hospital in Brooklyn, will be getting $51 million. And, you know, it's just out of this pool. So there, there's some really outrageous disparities, um, and they need some attention. And that could hopefully, if the money was going where it should go, could influence where services would go, could go, and who could get care. So I ask for that help. 
You have my undying support. You know that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm Lois Utley, um, Director of Women's Health for Community Catalyst and founder of the Merger Watch Project. Um, earlier this year, we published a report with uh, support from the New York State Health Foundation called Empowering New York Consumers in an Era of Hospital Consolidation. And I see that it's referenced in your briefing paper, so I won't repeat a lot of what you've already included in your briefing paper. But um, the main conclusion of the report is that at a time when all this transformation is happening in our health system, hospitals closing and downsizing and merging and care moving from inpatient to outpatient, consumers feel bewildered by what's happening. They don't understand it, they are not well informed, and nobody is consulting them about how this transformation could be done in a way that would be understandable, would address their needs, like for transportation, for um, help for people to navigate the new system. We basically concluded that <clears throat> consumers and our representatives, such as you city council members, often have little or no say in the state oversight of this ongoing transformation. So I want to focus a little bit on what we had to say about the certificate of need system. Um, we concluded that the CON system is not sufficiently transparent, consumer friendly, or responsive to local concerns. So for example, it does not currently require advance notice to affected consumers and their local officials when a hospital is going to close or downsize. It's amazing. The state public health law only requires a public hearing 30 days after the hospital closes. <laughs> what good is that? Uh, we need to have public hearings ahead of time. Um, Health systems that are taking over local hospitals are not required to spell out their long-range plans for their facilities, which could include down the road downsizing or closure, as we saw has happened with Mount Sinai Beth Israel. Um, there are no consumer health advocacy groups currently represented on that state CON review board, the Public Health and Health Planning Council. By law, there's supposed to be at least one consumer representative, and there is none. By law, there's supposed to be at least four representatives of hospitals, nursing homes, and other health care providers, and currently there are eight. So we have twice as many industry representatives on the council as is the minimum, and we have no consumer representative. It would be really beneficial to have representation on that FIPIC from consumer health advocates, particularly those who are familiar with the needs of vulnerable populations that we're concerned with here. Furthermore, there's no formal process for this FIPIC in the DOH to obtain and consider comments from local officials, such as members of the New York City Council or the City Health Department, about proposed consolidation or transformation of health providers. In the law, they're supposed to be getting recommendations from local health systems agencies, but I'm sure you're aware that HSAs were defunded, and we have only one left in the state out in Rochester. There is none in the New York City area. So at the FIPIC meetings, when they're reviewing recommendations from the, the DOH staff about a particular transaction, whether it's a merger or an acquisition, downsizing, there's a line in the summary that says HSA recommendation because they're supposed to be getting one. And it always says, except in the case of those from the Rochester area, NA, not available or not applicable. That is not the way decision making should be made. No consumers at the table, no input from local officials like you. So what could you do about this? First of all, tell state officials, the legislature and the governor, to ensure that health consumers and local officials who will be affected by hospital closures or elimination of key services like maternity 
are notified and engage. We recommend a requirement for 90 days advance notice when a hospital is going to close or downsize. We think that hospitals should be provided, uh, required to provide a proposed closure plan and take comments on that plan at a public hearing in the affected community at least 60 days in advance of the closing. And not during the daytime, by the way. At night or on the weekend when consumers who work can actually get to it. Uh, we think uh, there should be greater <coughs> transparency, consumer engagement and accountability when health systems take over community hospitals. We want a requirement that health systems have to project out into the future what they're likely to do with a community hospital they're taking over so that we're not surprised three years down the road by a plan to close the maternity unit or close cardiac surgery. Um, we need to have appointment of more consumer representatives to the FIPIC. We would love for you to join some other public officials I'm aware of who will be asking for this very shortly. And in general, we think um, the CON process needs to be reformed. It was created for a different era when hospitals were expanding and the purpose of it was to make sure we didn't get too many hospitals and duplicative services. It's not suitable for the current era of consolidation. I would note that that CON chart that's in your briefing paper and also in the uh, testimony from Greater New York um, does not make clear the fact that some of the CON applications do not go through that process that's delineated there. Those that are limited review, administrator review, or notice are never coming to the FIPIC and getting discussion in a public meeting. We need to take a, sh a close look at that as well. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I really have appreciated listening to your questioning of the hospital system officials, and I commend your work. Thank you. Am I on? Uh, good afternoon, and it's, it's, I'm very excited to appear in front of uh, you, council member, this afternoon. It's my first experience with you in this chamber. Um, I, I want to address the issue of disappearance of hospital options and the process that people have been talking about. Uh, and to some extent, I like to tell stories, so I'm going to tell some stories. I lived for 24 years on West 11th Street. I could walk to St. Vincent's Hospital. It was three blocks away. Um, I went there in 2006 with symptoms of a heart attack and had stents added to my heart. I walked over there with when my three-year-old had appendicitis. I went there with my wife who was in labor with our second child. I went there with my 80-year-old mother who was suffering from diverticulitis. We were able to get to the hospital immediately. Then St. Vincent's disappeared. Um, one, of the, one of the relevant points I read about, which was after, there were studies that were done after the hospital closed, which showed that the residents of NYCHA's Fulton Houses and Chelsea Elliott used St. Vincent's, most of the people that lived there used St. Vincent's as their primary care facility, as did many low-income people from Chinatown. But the ER was also full of many people who needed admission to the hospital. Uh, after St. Vincent's closed, the closest hospital with Beth, Beth Israel Years later, a standalone emergency room was established across the street from the site of the old St. Vincent's Hospital, but it has no beds or no ability to do any sort of emergency surgery. On the morning of January 31st last year, I woke up knowing I was having a heart attack. My wife drove me a block to the standalone ER, which took an EKG and said, you're going to Beth Israel Hospital. I was horrified. I was horrified because I had heard that Beth Israel was closing. I said, why there? They said, well, if you don't go there, you'll have to go to Lenox Hill on 60, what, 9th Street. So luckily it was a Saturday, and 10 minutes later I was at Beth Israel Hospital, and luckily my problem was dealt with with three more stents in their still open cat lab. But I learned later in the day that the heart surgery unit 
had been closed the week before. And if I had needed open heart surgery, I would have been shipped up to Mount Sinai Hospital on 100th Street. When the nurses at the hospital heard that I was the community's district leader and that I had become involved in efforts to keep Beth Israel opened, they chewed my ear off for two days about how horrible the closure of the hospital was and how needed it was for the impacted community. So as, as, as you know, I undertook a campaign to fight Beth Israel Hospital's closing. My research found two things. First, that the con process, which is already deficient, as Lois just discussed, had been short-circuited. To avoid any public process at all, the hospital segmented its applications. They broke each item down as to what in, that they were doing. And they said in their applications that the cost of their action was $500. For example, the maternity unit closed. I got the financials. They made $15 million a year from the maternity unit. But on their CON application, they said there was a cost of $500. That allowed the process to go along without any public notice other than on their website, without any public hearings, without any public hearings in front of various Department of Health bodies. And the Department of Health went along with this. The secret process, which I think is also applicable because of its impact on the affected communities, had also been ignored. And also, perhaps in part because the hospital didn't think it applied, and, and also because the Department of Health allowed the process to go forward in a segmented way. The secret process would have required a fully transparent public study of the impacts full of numbers, discussions of alternatives, and public hearings in the community. So as you know, last November I sued. Beth Israel Hospital has not filed any new CON since November. I'm not going to take credit for it, but they haven't. Quietly, I kept quiet about the lawsuit. While we navigated various motions to dismiss, I sued the, the Department of Health and Beth Israel Hospital. But last week, Judge Hagler, Judge Shlomo Hagler, said he denied their motions to dismiss and said that we could move forward. At that hearing, after the judge said that, they said, but judge, we're going to substitute a 200-bed hospital at the corner of 2nd Avenue and 14th Street. The judge said, well, they have 300 beds filled now. Isn't that enough? And I said, that's the first I think anyone has ever heard of this 200-bed hospital. <laughs> No public process, no announcement, no discussions, even with your office, which I know has engaged them a great deal. My point, while we continue to litigate this issue in court, I agree that the use of the emergency room for primary care is not a smart thing, but it must be addressed in a way that doesn't penalize people who don't know that, that the matter that they're going to the emergency room for is not of a life-threatening nature that requires potential admission. That is a very, very complicated decision for people to make. The hospitals that are closing their ERs and closing in consolidation are making that decision for people and telling them to go to clinics, which will then send them to hospitals if their, pos if their problem requires hospitalization. The disappearance of hospitals and the acute care which admittedly, admittedly is more expensive uh, and less profitable, is, I believe, becoming a crisis in our borough and in every other borough in this city. The current practice, the current practice of moving forward, as you just said, without fully transparent studies, based on transparent data about current and current usage and the impact of hospital elimination or partial elimination and without meaningful community input is wrong. It's dead wrong and probably has resulted in deaths. We cannot have people dying because, hospital, because hospitals are expensive, because hospitals need additional financing. We cannot have people forsaking procedures because the health system is concerned about the cost of a test or procedure. Thank you for your hearing. I have a, a Lois, you mentioned FIPIC and the lack of the, the seat. 
um, that's been vacant for quite some time. Yep. And so I think everyone on the panel, and I want to thank you for all of your work, Arthur. I know you've been working on this for a long time, and thank you for sharing your personal story. And Lois, you mentioned the, the vacant seat, and I absolutely agree that the certificate of need process is incredibly problematic and not truly inclusive of community and public right. engagement. And so I'm happy to work on legislation in terms of a resolution that we could send up to Albany and, and have them hopefully pass it uh, with a, a new body that we'll, we'll see in January. Great. Um, do you feel like if we, if we fill that seat with someone who truly understands what the consumer is going through and who has patient care and advocacy as their priority, that filling that seat with someone could truly make a change in terms of, of, of FIPIC and their powers? So the powers that they have and how they exercise them, is, it, is, it really being, is the community really being hurt by not having this, this consumer advocate? Well, the problem is there's no consumer voice at the table at all now. That's not to say that there aren't some very smart people on that council and people who do understand the needs of vulnerable populations. There are. But there's nobody who really can speak up for consumers. Um, there actually are two vacancies on the council right now, and I don't see why there can't be two consumer representatives appointed since there are twice as many health provider representatives as is suggested in the law. Um, what, what consumer representatives could do is ask the right questions during those FIPIC hearings. Um, all too often, um, the staff gives a summary of what the applicant has submitted. And there's a few questions, but not much. And they have a very packed agenda, and they sort of rush through it. And there's no opportunity for people from the public to testify either, except at the committee meetings. And again, those are very packed. And I, I went to every single one all of last year. And I think I might have been the only consumer <laughs> who actually testified about a hospital merger, consolidation, or downsizing. It's just not open and transparent. So I think at least getting one or more consumer representatives on the FIPIC would be a good start. But we also will need to probably help that person um, because the volume of material that the FIPIC members are asked to review on very short notice is overwhelming. Even some of the FIPIC members complain about it. It's often a thousand pages of documents one week before the advance of the meeting. So only those council members who come from big health systems and have assistants who can read all this stuff for them and tell them what it means can actually get through it and understand it. We'll need some help for those consumer representatives. And I want to just ask the, the, the both of you if you, I am very much willing to lobby the governor's office to put someone in those seats that we know it not keeps the consumer first and foremost in mind and who is willing to do the work. It's a lot of work and, yeah. and um, you're both, you have incredible resumes and reputations. Um, so if you do have recommendations, including yourselves, if you are up to it. I would really um, love to submit those names and try to lobby Albany to make sure that we are putting the people that we need um, on FITPIC. Thank you. Several of us did actually apply last year and never heard anything back. Okay. So we, we appreciate your help. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Okay. And the next panel is going to be Heidi Siegfried, Mark Hane, and Caitlin Hosey. And please correct me if I mispronounce your name. This will be the last panel. Unless there's any other members of the public that wish to testify, please fill out a form. If not, this will be the last panel. And I want to thank the three of you for your unbelievable patience today. No. Thank you so much. No. No. Sure, so I'm Caitlin Hosey from Live On New York. Thank you for having us here today. 
Um, I just want to start with a little background on Live on New York. So we are membership-based organizations. We have about 100 community-based organizations that are our members that operate senior centers, home-delivered meals, case management agencies, affordable senior housing, et cetera. Um, we also administer a citywide outreach program that helps older adults enroll in SCREE, Medicaid, um, and other benefits. Um, so through our work, we really strive to make New York a better place to age. And um, I just wanted to come give a different perspective on today's hearing. Um, and I can tell that it's one that's really valuable to the people in the room and uh, happy to have further conversations with you all. Um, so one of the things that we know in our work is that older, older adults are the foundation of New York and help build strong, <coughs> resilient communities. Central to these communities are these older adults who give back through caregiving um, for grandchildren and are a key source of information and communication with their family networks. Um, with this in mind, when looking at the healthcare system, in New York, it's important to ensure that one's view of healthcare takes into account the full landscape of services that an individual might seek um, in order to fulfill their care needs. And um, many of that will be for our members, uh, senior centers, home delivered meals, whatever that may be, uh, trusted sources of information in order to alleviate their concerns about their health and to have a positive impact on their overall health. Um, so I wanted to really jump into three specific examples of how our community-based uh, service network has impacts on health. Um, the first one that I'll get into is a housing with services model that's actually recently had a study, our member self-help community services. They did a study of their housing program um, that has a service coordinator in the program to help with information and referral and um, light services within the building. And they had a study of those individuals in that housing as compared to um, individuals in the surrounding zip codes, and they were able to find a 68% lower odds of hospitalization. And for those that are were hospitalized, uh, an estimated $4,000 savings per person per hospitalization. So just really tremendous impacts on healthcare spending, um, and even 53% lower odds of visiting an an emergency room as opposed to a, a different level of care. So these are interventions that are community-based that are um, often out of the landscape of our traditional uh, dialect uh, in healthcare conversations, but one that we wanna make sure uh, starts to get heard. Um, additionally, one thing that I wanted to bring up is the recent challenge related to information dissemination. Um, the State Department of Health just announced the closure of certain managed long-term care plans, MLTCs. Um, the state will be sending letters to patients with information regarding choosing a new plan. So this is something that our network, um, the case management network serves about 33,000 clients a year. They're actively preparing for this, learning information about which of their clients might be receiving these notices just so that they can help troubleshoot moving forward. So that's just an example of sort of the um, one-off type work that a case manager might be expected to do in helping their um, constituencies navigate the healthcare network. And it's really um, a, a tremendous cost savings and a value to the overall, el overall healthcare system. Um, so finally, I just wanna talk about a sort of more specific issue within the community-based services um, world, per se. Um, the community service-based sector, we need to begin to elevate them as partners to the healthcare world, and a lot of that starts with data. Um, it's very difficult for a lot of community-based service organizations to have data that is going to be able to participate in these district programs and to be able to be seen as a viable partner to the healthcare institutions. And that's something that we need to be able to empower community-based organizations to have control of their data, to have access to their data, to be able to um, serve the individuals coming through their senior center and whatnot. Um, so it's just something that we at Live On New York, we are willing to work with, whether it's the Department for the Aging, the state agencies involved, um, healthcare institutions to make sure that these conversations continue to progress to make sure the best outcomes for the um, healthcare institutions as well as the individuals on the ground in our case, older New Yorkers. 
So I really thank you for the opportunity to talk today and to just shed a little bit of a different perspective on things. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Heidi Siegfried. I'm the Health Policy Director at Center for Independence of the Disabled in New York. So I guess I'm, I'm uh, a good one to follow because I'm also going to be speaking about a particular population. We are a cross-disability organization, so we uh, serve people with all kinds of disabilities. Uh, you know, people usually think of the little uh, wheelchair symbol when they think of disability, but we serve people with um, hearing impairments, uh, visual impairments, uh, in addition to mobility impairments. Also, uh, people with cognitive conditions, uh, mental health conditions, you know, all kinds of disabilities. Um, we also have, uh, we're a navigator for the uh, New York State of Health Marketplace, and we also have a community health advocates program that helps people with the problems that they have after they've enrolled in, in health coverage, you know, trying to make it work. And um, we also have, um, we're, we have the independent, well, ICANN. It serves people with managed long-term care plans and dual eligibles. So um, the, um, most people with disabilities in New York City, they're, are, we're, they're more likely to have health insurance coverage rather than being uninsured. Um, but they're more likely also to be using public insurance, which would be Medicare and Medicaid. And, and you know, the, the American Community Survey statistics come out every year, and they just came out like last month, and the same, they, they give all this stuff about health coverage there, and it's, you know, the same thing. They also give prevalence, so you can see with all the five different kinds of disabilities what the prevalence is in New York. But um, anyway, so when you have providers, as been described um, by Judy, that discriminate against, um, against people with public health coverage, you, they are discriminating against people with disabilities as well. And um, so they really, you know, they really are another factor in this whole, uh, in addition to racism, we have discrimination against people with disabilities. So. Um, People with disabilities, you know, our statute, our civil rights statute is the Americans with Disabilities Act, and it's not about equality, it's about accommodation. So when a person with a disability is trying to get equal access to care, they, it's, it's an individualized negotiation with their provider. And depending on what kind of disability they have, it, you know, it's not just about accessible physical offices and things, but if you have a cognitive impairment and you um, need extra help in filling out forms or if you need help uh, in, in getting dressed and undressed, um, it's usually a lot of times it's, it's, it, the idea is that it's going to take more time and you have to basically train your provider how to provide care to you. And so when we see all these kinds of disruptions and, trans and transformations in, in the healthcare, in networks, and people have to change their providers, it's really, it's really a big deal because you're going to have to train your provider again, you know, how to accommodate your disability. And um, so that's, that's one of the things that we hear from, from our folks about when, when hospitals close or providers get dropped from networks or that kind of thing. Um, or, in, in fact, um, with a DISRIP as well. Um, and and uh, the guild net closure is having a big impact also on people with disabilities. I'm glad you brought that up um, because they were, they were a, 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 a plan that knew how to provide care an adequate number of hours to people that needed home care and as a result they went bankrupt. Like Judy said, it is, uh, you know, it is a matter of money often and we are not putting enough uh, money into the system to, to help our, our high needs, um, our high needs patients. Um, since I have a little bit more time, I'll just mention about DISRP and CBOs. Um, we are obviously a CBO. We obviously provide, um, you know, real value added to, to the, to these PPSs. Um, we don't just help people with health care problems, we also help people get their food stamps, housing assistance, all kinds of assistance like that. But, you know, nobody was interested in contracting with us to, to, to help 
provide these value-added services. And of course, a person with a disability who comes to us, they walk in the door and we're gonna serve them. So, you know, they get away with getting our services with us scrambling constantly to, to find funding. Um, so that's, that's, just, that's just my comment on, on what, as a CBO, we've experienced with uh, DISRO. Good afternoon, I'm Mark Hanna. I'm Director of Metro New York Healthcare for All. We're a citywide coalition of community groups and labor unions that w do healthcare advocacy work together. Um, I'm also sort of wearing my own hat as an individual patient. Um, I'm a constituent of yours, and um, I've been a patient at Beth Israel Medical Center uh, a few years ago. I also, in the early 1990s, used uh, the dental clinic at Gouverneur Hospital. And most recently, I was a patient for scheduled surgery at NYU Medical Center. So I've sort of run the gamut of uh, up First Avenue there in the Lower East Side. Um, so my testimony kind of reflects both my professional experience as well as my personal experience. So I just kind of wanted to lay that out there. And um, I'll, Though my own, in my own professional work, I've primarily focused on issues of health insurance coverage as opposed to delivery system issues. We really look to our sister coalition, the Commission on the Public's Health System, for leadership and guidance on that and support them and work with them on that. And uh, just wanted to kind of call that out and make note of that. But I guess uh, what I've seen over the last decade or so as hospitals have closed and merged and downsized, um, a few things kind of jump out at me that I thought I would raise in today's hearing. One is, and this has been mentioned by others at this hearing, um, the real importance of community engagement. Uh, and I, and uh, particularly from the get-go, it's not just a matter of coming in and saying, hi, here's our plan, what do you think of it? But really, so it becomes a fait accompli, but really um, engaging the community in developing whatever plan is going to happen from the start so that the community understands itself as proactive partners in the process versus finding themselves as reactive adversaries. Um, so that's one point I wanted to make. The second point in terms of uh, services in the community as services move from outpatient, inpatient settings to outpatient settings, and I don't think anybody has a problem with that in principle. We'd all rather be getting services at home or in the community rather than a hospital if we can avoid it, but as Mr. Rich mentioned, there are circumstances where inpatient services are required. And, so um, hospitals certainly have a role to play in our community. But as those services are moved into community-based settings, I think the key issue that the community is often concerned about is proximity. Um, so that, okay, uh, uh, as, uh, as uh, can I still, in the case of Mount Sinai and Beth Israel, for instance, if I need labor and delivery services, can I still do that, and I live on the Lower East Side, can I still do that in relative proximity to my home and my family and so forth, or must I go all the way up to 100th Street to deliver a child? Um, and I think that's a key issue, although the system looks at it from an efficiency standpoint that yes, it may make more sense from their point of view to have you go up to 100th Street to do the delivery. It's from the community's and family and person's patient's point of view, it's not desirable at all. And then just lastly, I'll just mention um, that I think uh, we as advocates and the community in general, I think it's New York's tradition of nonprofit and public health care needs to be protected and preserved. Because I think the f fundamentals of that drive how patient care is delivered, either in the inpatient setting or in the outpatient setting. Then I have a few recommendations to offer that are a little more detailed that sort of fall into three buckets. One is around issues concerning individual patients themselves. The second, the community, and sort of a third bucket is around larger system issues. So I'll just kind of run down them quickly. Um, I think it's important from the patient's point of view that uh, the full complement of services be available in the community as they are moved from outpatient settings, sort of a 
from inpatient to outpatient setting, sort of that concept of a hospital without walls, that everything is kind of still there. Um, that support be provided for family and informal caregivers if we're moving things out of institutional settings. I know in my own situations when I was discharged, um, a lot of it fell on me and close friends and family and so forth, and we weren't always well prepared for whatever needed to do. Um, and uh, this is mentioned earlier, but to have smooth transitions that aren't particularly rushed. Um, the uh, importance of having professional and paraprofessional services available in the home and community-based setting, the use of community health workers, I think is uh, something that is important. And the importance of uh, community health education programs out in the community so that uh, members of the community can understand how to take care of themselves, utilize the healthcare system efficiently, keep themselves healthy, and so forth. Um, as been mentioned by others, the importance of engaging local nonprofit community based organizations, particularly in lieu as uh, helping to address the social and economic determinants of health to keep people healthy. Um, the importance of evening and weekend hours for services. I, I think is something um, that is important. Um, sort of more community things, I mentioned the engagement of community-based organizations. Um, I want to mention one thing that I, I know exists in the public system that I think is important, but I'm not sure to what extent at all it exists in the private or voluntary system, and that is that each facility in its network has a community advisory board. I think they have a really important role to play, um, that the board is meets regularly and is consulted. Um, the importance of ongoing uh, community engagement with the community health needs assessments that are required of facilities under the Affordable Care Act, and uh, the uh, uh, assessments that are done after the fact of how many services were actually delivered. Uh, when all was sort of said and done to the community. And again, involving the community from the get-go in that in a proactive manner. Um, and uh, lastly, in terms of the community, I think it's important for healthcare systems to in regularly engage on an ongoing basis with the community boards. Uh, each and every community board has some sort of committee that deals with health and human services and those Facilities need to be regularly engaged in that. And um, to use those uh, community boards as in lieu, since we don't have any health system agencies anymore, perhaps they could become somewhat of a de facto health planning entity in the community, working with the borough presidents, working with the council, working with the mayoral administration, so that there is some proactive health planning that happens across our city. Um, and uh, lastly, in terms of a community concern, making sure that as services are moved out into the community that they're easily accessible by means of public transit. Um, I, I think that's important. Um, that uh, the services are nearby uh, to uh, traditionally underserved and higher need communities, I'm thinking, and populations naturally occurring require, retirement communities, uh, public housing campuses, stuff like that, that the services are, are readily accessible to them. Lastly, just the larger system issues you touched on, that was your conversation with Lois Utley about the importance of uh, oversight of hospital and health systems. It's, uh, the, the state has its role. Perhaps there's a role that this the city, local government could develop and play, particularly around issues of planning, implementation of those plans, holding the elements of the system accountable. Um, and lastly, I just want to touch sort of on the uh, intersection of delivery system with insurance coverage, because I think one affects the other. As uh, services are moved out into the community, I think it's important that the new entities that come forth are uh, parts of uh, healthcare plans, 
um, and that includes Medicaid plans, our essential plan plans, uh, the uh, Medicare Advantage plans, and the private qualified health plans that are available on the New York State of Health Marketplace. We need to make sure that provider entities are contracting with all of those plans so that I have whatever coverage I have is meaningful for me to use. And that if, you, if, uh, if I could ask a, a question, uh -huh. and, it, and it's also for the providers, do you find that a lot of the, the people that you serve or your members, um, when something like this happens, when a transformation is underway in, in their community, are they looking for more community-based organizations to go to rather than the hospital? Do they come to you for these sorts of referrals and references? Or are they more kind of in panic mode because their local hospital is closing down? I'm, I say that because um, the Gotham Network, we, we want people to visit more community-based mm -hmm. uh, clinics. And um, clearly, that's in partnership with you all. You are the frontline people that speak to just the everyday New Yorker. And so do you find that people come to you for these references or referrals, or that when a hospital is closing, it's more of a, a, a panic mode because they just don't have the information? Well, we were, um, I, you know, I, we were a little bit involved with the St. Vincent's closing, um, and we participated in that study after the fact. Um, I mean, I think, I think our community health advocates did get call, calls from people that were looking for how they were going to continue to get their care. But I mean, I think a lot of times, I mean, it really is, I mean, when, um, when Dr. Katz talks about the patient relationship, I really like that because, I mean, especially for people with disabilities, that relationship is so key. And so that's why, you know, they, they basically want to keep the providers they have. So when there's like changes in health plans, for example, that, I mean, you're trying, and, and especially people who have complex care and they have a whole bunch of different providers, it's really hard to be able to continue, you know, to see the providers that you want to, for them all to be in the same plan and then to have your formulary be on. So that's the kind of work that we do. Um, I put out a call um, about, about, the, uh, about the Mount Sinai issue and I did get some emails back from from consumers that were concerned about it, and did come to the FIPIC meeting actually to, um, you know, to testify. Um, and they were, I mean, they were concerned. I, I, like Mark was saying about this proximity issue, um, you know, they were concerned about how they were going to get up to, you know, Columbus Circle or 116th Street or whatever. I'm um, not just for not. It wasn't an issue of just the. Um, people that need care, but also their family members who might want to visit them who might have a disability that have to use Accessoride, which is like hopeless. <laughs> and, um, you know, th maybe the, they have to use public transportation. That would be, it would be better if the thing was like in the, that if, their, if their loved one was in a, a facility in, in the neighborhood. Um, so, and that's that's the main things that I can think of that we heard from our consumers. I, I I would echo a lot of that. I think while I can't speak specifically to a, a, a recent proposed closure or one that has gone through, I think that senior center directors specifically often act as hubs of information for everything going on in the community <laughs> and as sort of an information source. And um, I can actually I know that this isn't exactly the same, but. Uh, recently, there were a lot of federal proposals related to SNAP, and there was a lot of concern um, among the senior community about what was going to happen and if their um, food stamps were going to be at risk moving forward. And even that, even though that was not going to be happening, and there was a lot of steps in that process that still needed to happen, there was a lot of information and explanation that needed to be happening from senior centers directors, case managers, et cetera, and I would imagine it's the same in regards to healthcare situations. The MLTC is a good example of that where they're certainly preparing to assist their clients um, with a transition. Well, thank you, thank you. Did, did you wanna I just add had something? one last point, it was related to this. I, I, I think one thing that's con confusing for patients oftentimes is they have an insurer network 
but also then their provider network is sort of another network and they may or may not overlap and that becomes really confusing. So what I would like to urge both insurers and providers to do is to start to sync up your networks because it will make it a whole lot easier for you and for your patients. So. And I, I, I agree, and I think that one thing that um, H&H mentioned that they're working on is a more streamlined way to get people to <clears throat> see a primary care physician or a specialist and hopefully the right hand talks to the left hand because I know it can be incredibly intimidating even right. navigating my own health system. So. Right, right. <coughs> Thank you all. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for, thank you for holding this hearing. Yeah, I, I just want to say thank you to everyone who was here today. Um, clearly, I think we all agree that it has to be a holistic approach when we're talking about health care and that discrimination really does exist when it comes to policy around health care and that, that lack of, quite honestly, uh, social and racial and economic justice in terms of treating health care as a fundamental human right. So I think community engagement is key right out the gate and I hope that with some legislative changes maybe to the certificate of need process or even just getting adequate representation on something as important on FITBIC um, that I look forward to working with all of you and of course the H&H &H and the volunteer hospitals and, and that protecting Healthcare in a nonprofit and community-led way is, is so critical. So I just want to thank everyone, and if there are no other members of the public that wish to testify, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>